blah, 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 blah. On today's Poker Live podcast, me and Garrett Adelstein will solve the problems to the world. And by that, I mean we will talk about the wonderful world of high stakes poker, guys. What's going on, everybody? My name is Joey Angawani, Chicago with Joey. Uh, uh, they tell me on the behind the scenes analytics on YouTube that the first five to 10 seconds are extremely important. And um, and that was what I just came up with beforehand. Welcome to the Poker Live podcast. Uh, my name is Jordan Wanike, Chicago. Joey, guys out there, iTunes officially updated. Search the Poker Life. It only took me six months, but all the podcasts are up on iTunes. Please go ahead and, uh, and check those out. And uh, joining me on the podcast today, man, is a young man who, long time poker player, long time member of the poker community. Um, I forgot about the former reality star thing because we did talk about that. I'm at out of line at the bike show, me and Garrett did a few months back, but was on Survivor at one point in time. He debatably is one of the most ripped people ever on Survivor in the history of the game. He's a guy who has been battling in the high stakes streets and live at the bike on Poker After Dark. Uh, he's one of my favorite players to, to watch play the great two card of pot, two card pot in Omaha, the game. And I think he's a lot of people's out there favorite player to watch right now. And uh, yeah, definitely one of the people I enjoy talking to a great deal in the poker world. We're joined by my buddy G-Man, a.k.a. Garrett Edelstein. What's up, Garrett? Welcome okay. officially to the Poker Life Podcast. Appreciate that. Thank you for the, the warm introduction. Uh, always good to be talking to you, with you, whether podcast or club, sober or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, people are commenting on my hair. So listen, guys, if you guys remember, I used to do my hair all the time and I used to kind of look like this and I, I've been wearing hats lately, but I felt inspired by and by that felt inspired. I mean, I don't know why my, I did my hair, but my hair is done today. I didn't walk through a tornado. OK, Jordan, I didn't go through a tornado. I don't know. Garrett, what do you think about this hair? GTO or not? In line or out of line? What do you think? I think it's nice, man. You know, like. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Thank you. OK, I feel good now. So it's a tank top poker life podcast edition. Uh, but yeah, man. For you guys who don't know Garrett, Garrett's been uh, he's been around Poker World man a long time. He used to play a lot online, make videos for um, he used to make videos for for uh, Deuces Cracked. Did you make videos for Run It Once as well too, Garrett? Yeah, I think I I, I made videos for Deuces Cracked from like oh I don't know, let's say oh six to oh eight, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then Phil asked me to just like make a few for Run It Once, and so I did, and then he you know then he wanted me to make some more, and at that point I. I was like just so over poker training sites and just thought they were like quite a cancer. Uh, like if other people want to make poker training videos moving forward, obviously I'd be a hypocrite to like tell them they're doing something wrong, but it's just a personal choice for me that like I wanted to get way out of that game whenever, whenever the last video I made was, which I think was like 13, 2013 or something. So. You know, it's funny. I used to think the exact same about training sites and I realized how much of a, a selfish way I was coming from. I was like, God, I hate training sites. Like, what the fuck, man? Why are you going to put this information out there? But I think a lot of the reasons why I felt that way was because I wanted all the information for myself. I was like, oh, I don't want people. Like, I worked so hard to get good at poker. I don't want other people to just put this out there for free in a lot of ways. And I think that was my biggest reason I didn't like training sites. Yeah, totally. Like, uh, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm, like, doing, you know, the Lord's work by, like, you know, not necessarily endorsing training sites. It's just like, I personally don't want to contribute any further to that, you know? And I mean, hopefully the, the mark I've made is like incredibly small, but I still just have like all these euros when they come to LA, just like coming up to me, like fanboying, like, oh my God, your four videos you ever made on Run It Once mean everything to me. And I'm just like, whoa. It just makes me regret it even more every time I hear something like that, you know? But, Anyway, it's uh, it is what it is, and and obviously, you know, like you said, like we all take something from training videos. So to sit and just hate on it entirely is it's wildly hypocritical, and I'm not going to do that. I just I've been out of that game quite a while. So yeah, we'll definitely talk more about these fanboys coming up to you and talking about the four videos that you made and how much they love it because that, that that's got to be quite interesting if you're not a very big proponent of sharing that strategy out there. But I think a lot of people in the poker world know you from your recent battles on Live at the Bike, on the High Stakes Friday games, the, the 50, 100, 100, 200. Sometimes it gets 100, 200, 400. Sometimes I don't even know if it feels like it gets out of line pretty pretty quickly lately. And then also you bat a little bit on Poker After Dark, and you played a couple big pots on there. I think the first time you got on there, you won, well, how much did you win? Like 600,000, 500,000, something absurd like that? I don't know, man. It seems like 
every time I play on a televised game, like I somehow figure out a way to run even hotter than the time I did before, you know? So I, I really don't know the exact numbers, but I know it felt like both of the day ones of my two poker after dark appearances, I just, I just ran completely insane. And so I guess sort of this more most recent public downswing I've been on, on a few live the bike games is, is well earned to say the least. Yeah, man, it really seems like every time you play, I'm not sure how you do this, bro. I mean, I I, I do know how you do this actually, <laughs> but you're either up like a hundred thousand and you're down like seven hundred. I mean, it's crazy. Like I'm like you, Gary could honestly be up four hundred k. I don't know what the stakes might even be. You might be fifty one hundred. I don't. I, I it's and and then down that much. I'm how the fuck does this guy do? It, it, it's something that I just haven't seen in quite a long time when it comes to when it comes to swings on, on these poker televised shows. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is like almost everything I'm doing especially pre-flop is just like so wildly outside the box that like the variance I kind of deal with is, is just truly insane. You know, like I can remember one session I played online with the bike three or four weeks ago, I lost a big number. And that day, like, I mean, there was just next level how poorly I was playing. Um, so that was just like kind of a, like a perpetual cycle of just like play shitty, play shittier, play shittier. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, like I'm fine with my like the way I play, and I, you know I can still lose a thousand bigs or whatever in a session. Uh, it's just kind of the nature of uh, my rather spastastic poker game. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what you call it? Would you call it a spaz a spastastic game? I would call it a extremely aggressive game that puts you in a lot of high variance spots. That sometimes you look like a genius sometimes you you look a little bit insane and sometimes it's a combination of both so i i'm not sure spastastic but maybe people other people might use that word i suppose but i, I kind of see it and and that's not what i take away when i when i watch you play sure well i appreciate that yeah and you know the viewers of your show they're all like as you say like incredibly winning players and whatnot so i'm not gonna bullshit them and you know i, I definitely think highly of my own poker game and there's definitely like in my mind, like a method and quite a, a logical, rational method to, to sort of everything I'm doing out there. Um, but yeah, it doesn't always look like that, especially when, when just like every single hand is not going well. And it's again, like, so sort of counter to, I think, uh, the lines people would typically take in, in a multitude of situations. So this method to your madness, is this, is this a quantifiable strategy that you have, or is a lot of this based off of pure intuition combined with hundreds and thousands? And I don't know how long we've been alive, but fuck it. Let's just say millions of hours of just thought running through your mind where you're just thinking about things over and over and over and over again for the past 10, 11 years now. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of that. It's a little bit of everything. You know, I think, when I'm playing in softer games, um, in like pre-flop for sure, and like the vast majority of post-flop spots, like you know, I'm really not, uh, I'm really not all that concerned with sort of playing optimally, you know, because my opponents are deviating so far from optimal that you know, I'm just like you said, like kind of just taking years of live poker experience and uh, and and just you know, kind of just doing whatever I think is best. Sometimes with you know, awesome results and many times with disastrous results, you know, but I think with that being said, you know, when I'm playing in tougher lineups, uh, I really do try and focus on, on sort of giving my opponents the respect they deserve um, mm -hmm. on every street. Uh, and, and so I feel like my play in those situations is at the very least a lot less exploitable, still certainly exploitable because like, I feel like even the best live players make such a, uh, such huge mistakes compared to the best like online players. Um, but, but sort of uh, it, it's almost like a completely different mindset, you know, and sort of the new, the new wave of poker learning, poker training, et cetera. Um, you know, that it's all software and all of these things to me, it's, it's just like endlessly fascinating sort of learning about like what would be optimal, like in a variety of situations. And then, trying to take that information and convert it to, you know, the millions of lives, uh, live poker situations mm -hmm. playing with some, you know, I'm going to call them like very good, but not world-class players. Bang, and, bang. Yeah. And a few like just straight bad players. It, it's just like a, it's an incredibly complicated thing, you know, like even I feel like, uh, getting pretty good at learning how to play GTO, like 
I don't know. I don't even know if I'm phrasing that right. Like improving on that skill, even though you would never come close to close to close. Uh, that is so incredibly hard. But then to take that and then apply it to live poker, it's it's just like next level. And I think it just takes like so many hours, so much skill, so much intuition. Uh, and that's why I think being like a truly elite live poker player is it, it's just so incredibly hard. But but certainly the guys who who work on their game outside of the tables, I feel like they they on average have a huge edge over over, let's say, some of these like live season vets that don't necessarily study off the tables anymore, but have great intuition. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think I, it seems like to me it would be the challenge of combining that that modern study with the years of the intuition when it comes to being a live poker player. And and I don't know if I'm ever going to quite try to find this out for myself. I feel like when you play live in the deep stack situation, especially you, you're you're always sitting with 750,000 big blinds, so you're you're playing some very unique deep stack situations that you just do not find on the internet. I don't know if the solvers are quite uh, are quite breaking these these thousand big blind. I, I I don't know if there's uh, if these are solved quite yet. So it's I think to me it would seem like you, you take the study that you learn online, you figure out little bits and pieces you can take into your actual strategy playing live. Maybe it might be some smaller bet sizes and certain textures combined with over bets in different spots. Which we know that you are a you are a very big lover of over betting. Actually, watching you over bet has made me want to. Overbet, but I can't. I think Ray can one Omaha. So I've actually had to play Nolan Hold'em, be able to overbet and get that joy. And I gotta say, Garrett, I gotta say, there's there's not many three X potting a Turner River is a lot of fun. I see why you like to do it. It really it, it's is really very fun. I like it a lot. And like if nothing else, like just to see your opponent's head explode, you know. <laughs> like, so except except like when they just have the nuts, you know. A couple of times lately, I'm just like mashing 1.5 or 2x pod just getting snapped by the nuts so that part's not fun but really anything but getting snapped by the nuts is, is kind of fun you know i feel like i've got like quite a bit of hero in me like at all times you know so i feel like over betting coincides nicely with that you know where i'm like what would be a reasonable choice here and i'm like yeah let's just bet four times that amount you know okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no uh Definitely going back to what you were talking about earlier, and I'll use Doug as an example just because he's obviously, you know, as you say, the supreme leader, the most well-known poker player on earth probably at this point. You know, he always aggressively argues, like, this is how I play poker. This is the way to play poker. Right. Right, but he's wrong. <laughs> you know, like, uh, without question, like, when your opponents are incredibly good and whatever, that's got to be the choice. But there's just no way that's, like, that's just the best way to play poker. If you can figure out how to incorporate that, while also incorporating exploits and also be like hyper aware of where you are potentially being exploited by doing so and having the knowledge to know if or to what extent your opponents is going are going to counter exploit you like to me that's you know that that's that's where the money's at and that's i mean that's incredibly hard to do and i'm not going to sit here and act like i do that perfectly or or anything close to that but that's certainly what I'm trying to do. And there's, you know, certainly a reason why, you know, oftentimes when I'm playing poker, you know, my V pip is like, you know, 1.5 X the next guy, you know, it's either, uh, you know, it, it could just be terrible, but, but nobody really knows, you know, like you just can't know, um, you know, especially if you're playing, you know, in a game with like three huge spots or something nine handed. And another thing, and this is this is what well, this is very obvious to to most of your viewers probably again since they're all winning poker players mm -hmm. you know PO's not going to do anything for you in multi-way pots well you're playing live poker there's a fuck ton of three plus way pots you know um so there's just like an endless sea of situations that come up that and and i'm very thankful for this uh you know some of these up and comers can't study and you just you just gotta know you know so yeah, I think that that's kind of the biggest thing about. Um, oh, here, let go. <coughs> echo, echo. Ooh. Do you hear the echo? Me. People in the chat, do you hear the echo? No. Maybe it's just me. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing with kind of the style you mentioned is is teaching that. Whereas Doug came out with a formula and a system to be able to teach a way to play the game and then advocate for that game. And it's pretty easy to advocate. This is how you play. This is how I play. This is what you should do. Whereas a lot of the things you might be talking about and 
and some of the things I might be talking about when it comes to Potland Omaha, a lot of those things aren't necessarily quantifiable. So you can't really know if what you're doing is good or bad, or there's no way to like prove that this is this is the right way or the wrong way. And I think that's one thing to me that's always made poker very fascinating is that there are a number of different styles and strategies that you could use that might allow you to be a winning player. Obviously, as these solvers come out for different game types and more of the situations become less of a debate and more of a, well, this is what the solver says to do. Poker obviously changes. And, uh, but, but you mentioned, but live poker, who knows if that's ever really going to change because you mentioned a lot of multi-way pots and uh, very deep stack play. The dynamic at the live poker table, obviously much different than online. We've always known that, but yeah, I feel like it's becoming more and more of a more and more of a different kind of world compared to online and uh, and live poker. Yeah, I mean you're, that that argument is is well taken in terms of like, well, if you're trying to teach others, like you can't teach others like intuition, or or you can to only some extent, and they're just going to make potentially huge mistakes all along the way. So that point's very well taken, and it's funny like. These days I do very uh, little coaching just because like the market for, it just almost never makes sense because like anyone who could like afford coaching from me, like is probably someone I'm going to play against, you know? So for that reason, I just essentially always decline. But in the rare times, like I have done it in recent years, um, I've realized like now more than ever uh, how challenging it is to kind of teach a lot of what I do. Whereas I used to do, an endless sea of coaching, like 10 to 15 hours a week when I was like playing high stakes heads up online for years and years. Mm. And I was able to teach that so much more like uh, easier. Like, and, and I feel like that was because to a very large extent, a lot of what I was teaching was more technical and methodical and procedural in that nature. But, but still with a good met bit of psychology and metagame. Um, as well. But anyway, I just, I just feel like it just doesn't translate now. Like people just play poker like well enough now um, that the difference between, you know, like in a, in a high stakes, like, you know, uh, live game, the difference between the biggest winner and the second biggest winner. Like, I don't even think that guy could really coach that the second biggest winner that much. I feel like a lot of that, like, it's just like years of, again, years of sort of, uh, you know, you know, live reads, intuition, psychology. It's just, it's just like experience, you know, I, I suppose you could, but it wouldn't be nearly as beneficial as, as maybe one would think. Yeah. Do you think you're the, you're the best player in a lot of the games that you end up playing? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't like talking about it. <laughs> here, here, here's what I'll say about it. Hey, I already, I already knew the answer. I already knew the answer. I was just like, oh my God, I'm just going to ask. I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hear, I'm going to hear the answer to this question from Gary. <laughs> it's funny. You obviously already know the answer too. <laughs> you know, you're just, you're just trolling me, but no, uh, no, but what I will say about that is like, you know, like I'm always just happy to play, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I, I love just playing poker. Not really nine people that much. Uh, but, you know, if if one or two or three other guys, you know, want to play a really big game, like, you know, I'm I'm always happy just to play. Uh, I just enjoy that. Uh, for me, poker first and foremost always has been about the mental stimulation and not the money. Uh, and I've just gotten lucky to have done well. And especially at this point in my life, like, I've done a lot of study and thought, like on sort of money and how it affects my life positively, negatively, like whatever, you know? And it's like, I feel pretty strongly, like if I were to lose like 90% of my role, like um, it wouldn't really like change my life much at all, you know? And so that's part of the reason why, like, I don't know. I, I feel like it allows me to play better. Uh, and it's why I do a bunch of other dumb shit that I should probably stop like flipping, like whatever, you know? Cause right. I feel like people are just so attached to their money and, and, and I just couldn't be more the opposite. So. Yeah, I do think that is also a, a big reason why people do kind of gamble a little bit or, or have some sort of degen moments. I think I'm the same in a lot of ways too, where it was never really about money for me. It's still isn't unfortunate, which could be bad, I think in a lot of ways, but, and that's sort of why I might be a little more lackadaisical. It's why I've, I've never been afraid to lose a lot of money in different situations because it's like, oh, whatever, I could, I'll make it all back. I'm not really worried about it. So. I feel like having that approach is good in some ways, but also can be quite negative in some ways too. And that, yeah, maybe a, lot, a little, a lot more risk to the approach that we have. Sure. And, you know, I think thresholds are sort of important here too. You know, the difference between, you know, 
uh, I don't know, let's just say annual income. You could use anything, liquidity, like whatever. But the difference between someone, you know, making 20,000 versus making 60,000 versus making 150,000, each of those thresholds are, are, are quite a bit different, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think the difference between, uh, I guess, to kind of to illustrate the point and maybe overstate this a little bit, the difference between someone making 150K a year and making five million a year, in my mind, is very, very little. Uh, and if uh, if if you like can't find peace in your life making 150 k a year, uh, it seems extremely unlikely to me that you would find it making you know 100 x that either. Gary, are you at peace in your life right now? Um, I'm going to say 80 percent yes. So I've I basically dedicated like my 20s to to getting there, you know, through. You know, and I don't, I don't mind talking about a lot of these things publicly, you know, through a variety of hacks, mechanisms, therapy, psychologists, et cetera. Um, I definitely think that I've made like a lot of progress in that. But one thing I think I can say about this that would be of note to people is uh, the correlation between my like net worth and sort of the peace I'm living with in my life. There's, there's just no correlation whatsoever. It's just never been related. Uh, at all. And I guess that's easy to say, you know, because, you know, ever since I was like 18, I always had like at least like, you know, a hundred thousand liquid or, or something like that, even at a very young age. Um, but I feel like, again, that goes to further prove my point that like, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I know like a lot of poker players, like let's say that play like medium or medium high games that have like net worth between like, let's say 250, 500 K, something like that. And, you know, like some of them talked to me about if they could, 10x that how like everything in their life would be fine and i think that's a very very misguided uh thought process uh and if you're not if you're not happy with with where you're at with with that kind of money like i don't think 10x is going to help you or or 100x to be honest so yeah, probably probably not that, controversial but yeah ahead. i think having that hope or having that sort of i think like that provides a lot of motivation for people to have that thought in their mind well if i just have 10x this i'm going to be the happiest guy in the world Whereas if maybe if you lose that, if you lose that perspective on maybe it won't change my life that much, it could definitely take away motivation from certain people out there if they sort of say, okay, well, it ain't going to change my life. Like, fuck it. I'm not even going to try. So it, I could see positives and negatives from sort of having that thought process or, or that mindset about it. That's a, that's a great point. I'm really glad you brought that up. And I completely, completely agree with that, actually. Um, that's an important caveat to what I just said. Because even I, like I have a number right now that I'm trying to get to liquid um, that I'm not going to say on the stream. Um, and it's like having that number is very, very important to me uh, in terms of um, to some extent finding purpose in my day and even life, you know? So like if, if, because basically what you're, if I didn't think that way, like I would just basically like never get out of bed or never do anything like professionally professional, uh, any pr professional endeavors or anything like that. So I think having that goal is really important, but it is such a double edged sword because like, on the other hand, like you can just like constantly feel unhappy, like, because you're not there yet. You can, you know, let's say, I don't, let's say someone's numbers a million or something. Right. And let's say they're at 500 and then they go on a downswing and now they're at 400. Like that is so tilting. If you're just obsessed with getting to a million. Right. You're what what's, you know, as as I'm sure most people know, it's like you're like peak stuck. Right. And like people who can't find peace in their life when they're peak stuck, you're just like drawing stone dead at being happy. Because like how often what percentage of days are you going to live in your life where you're like stuck peak? Like, you know, hopefully if you've acquired a bunch of wealth, you have a variety of investments, poker, etc. Like there's so much variance in all those things that you're going to be peak stuck like the vast majority of your days in life, you know. And so like. You basically, uh, you have to figure out a way to kind of, uh, what I would say, like open a new container, uh, shout out to Chris Sparks, did some personal development coaching with him. He taught me that it's like one of my favorite things. I'll elaborate on that in a second, but you have to like, let's say again, you, you have 500 K to your name and you play a big game and you lose a hundred K, right? Which is a, obviously a fuck ton for you. Uh, the ability to wake up the next day, open a new container and say, okay, that's over. My net worth is now 400. The goal isn't to get back to five. It's to like execute uh, like on my goals for today. 
you know, it's so hard to do, but it's, I, I think it's so important. Um, and it's, it, and you know, I, I use this concept of containers in everything in my life. Oh, cute. Um, so like, <laughs> Sorry, no one can see that. What just happened there? But uh, not. you know, fitness has been like a big part of a uh, big part of my life forever. Um, and uh, and it's like whenever I have like a few days off, one thing that's helped me so much is I used to just be like everything has to be perfect. So I take a few days off from the gym, and I'd be like, ah, fuck it. Like I already look like shit because you know, like I've, I'm like a bit of a head case, have a series of cognitive distortions. That again, like I've worked really hard on over the years to make some progress. Uh, and so I'd be like, all right, well, now I'm fat, now I'm gross. Might as well continue to lie in bed and eat pizza every day, right? Well, like this concept of opening a new container where you say, okay, those three days are gone. I have the choice now to start fresh and execute today. It's just like the most powerful sort of thing in the world to me. And it can be applied to any sort of depress depression, mourning, anything you're dealing with to just wake up and make the choice to, to start fresh. And, you know, I think it, for those of uh, your viewers who sort of have a lot of these perfectionist tendencies in the way I do, um, it, I, it, it's, it's an endlessly important skill for me. So. You mentioned a lot of things in there. And uh, first thing, shout out to Chris Sparks, AKA go muck yourself, uh, fr friend of the podcast, guest of the podcast, a guy who, who's been doing a lot of uh, coaching kind of work like that as well. Uh, personal development, kind of working with businesses and stuff like that in New York City and traveling the world, getting out of line a little bit. And then you said a guy who had 500K and he lost 100K. And I was like, man, that guy sounds like a fucking idiot. But then I was like, wait, I've actually done that before. So I was like, wait. <laughs> I was sitting there. As you said, I'm like, what kind of fucking idiot would, would lose 100K if he only had 500K to his name and then lose that high stake? I was like, no, no, I've definitely done that, though. Yeah, I feel like the answer is like 80 to 90% of live poker players. <laughs> I just think that that's... And to be honest, I'm not sure that that would be such a bad thing, you know? Like, if you're going to get in a spot that's, like, so good that you could lose 100, like, you know, go for it. Like, I know in earlier parts of my poker career, I was always a super strong advocate of just, fuck it, like, let's go for it. Like, whenever I had a big edge in anything, like, I, I was happy to just, like, risk way more than what would probably be, uh, would probably be reasonable, you know, but... I don't know. I, as people probably know by now, this is the I'm way, way conservative guy in the world. So that's why a lot of people have gone broke. By the way, okay, like I mean, yeah. it's very rare to overcome these type of things. It's very rare to have this sort of approach to poker, willing to to lose all your bankroll. And who knows? At any given time, you think the spots right. I mean, I've known a lot of guys. I'm sure you've known a lot of guys, Garrett. Yeah. They aren't playing much poker anymore because they had this aggressive uh, mentality to poker, and it's very it's just hard to overcome that. And uh, and, and yeah, man, I'm sure you've seen a lot. Sure, yeah. I mean, I feel like everyone in my poker is broke. I've had so many close friends over the years that I think are truly great poker players that are either broke or close to it or quit or want to quit. And I just think it's uh, I think it's an incredibly tough gig. I will. I'm like, I never encourage anyone to become a professional poker player. And almost without exception, anytime professional poker players are considering getting out and talking to me about it. Basically, in every one of those spots, once I know the full story, I'll go get the fuck out, you know, and some of them do, some of them don't, they lose some more and then they get out or some of them are still hanging on by a thread. But uh, yeah, man, it is, uh, it's tough out there these days for sure. I think that's where a lot of our generation is. I feel like you're actually kind of like the generation maybe before me were a couple of years. So a lot of the guys there now are, 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 they've been in that place for years, but you know, now every, every year that passes by more and more people are are trying to get out or want to get out or, or whatever. I mean, I don't know if it's because anytime you do something for so long, that's just the mentality you have. If you used to do something at a very high level, very successful level, and then 10 years later, eight years later, you, you can't do it at that level anymore and you want kind of constant growth in what you do and get better at what you do, I can understand why poker would be something that isn't the best for that with the ecosystem as it is these days. So yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely... I can definitely empathize with people who feel that way, who are longtime professionals who struggle with the idea of keep continuing to play or wanting to get out or what they should do with their life. Because, yeah, I feel like uh, certainly a place I've been in a little bit these past year or two. Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely really tough. And, uh, you know, for myself personally, like if you were to ask me, how, why are you still in it? Uh, a couple of things come to mind. Number one is like I take breaks a lot, like extended breaks. 
And just in general, I don't play very many hours, you know, uh, big games just don't go very often. And occasionally I'll just be like in a poker mood mindset, whatever. And I'll play, you know, two or three days a week for a while in, in, you know, games as small as like 20, 40, no limit. Um, but like, you know, more or less, like I'm only playing like once a week or whatever over the past, like several years. Um, and that's really kept poker from like going, st getting stale for me, which kind of leads me to my second point. And that's that I just still love poker. Like I just, I love everything about it. Like I love playing with like the weird old man regs who just like, you know, angle and have all the quirks and it just what like everything about it, you know? I love like some of the young up and comers who like I hang out with, uh, you know, at the table. Like I just, I'm such an extrovert and I think I just love people so much that I always have a great time. I love the challenge of it. Like I love playing, you know, two to two to five handed live poker, you know? Uh, more than that, it's it's certainly more tedious, but it's just fun. And, uh, you know, like, I don't know, it's always fascinating to me, again, with this sort of evolution of poker over the past few years, that too just fascinates me so much and sort of figuring out how to utilize that information and incorporate it into live poker scenarios. Like, I don't know why, I just still care. I still just think about that stuff all the time. I think it's super fascinating um, and... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, I just love it. And I think if that's one thing I think when I talk to some friends about this stuff and they're contemplating getting out, I go, do you love poker anymore? Do you love sitting in your house studying? Do you like love like hour 15, like in a good game and like, you're not going to leave because like you want it more, you know? And in the vast majority of situations, like these guys are saying no to that. And I feel like when that's the case, like I just, I just don't, I just don't think you can win, you know, and I think, or you can't win at the level you want to. And I think that one more thing, I think my competitiveness has also played a role in me continuing to play poker because I'll go and play a while and there'll be like a few guys who are like now like the new hot shots, you know, like they'll like want to cover me for a little while. They'll want to play big for a little while, like, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, and I'm just such a competitor that I'm just like, let's play as big as possible like, let's buy in as much as possible. And like, let's just go, you know, let's just go to war. And I don't know, I just, I'm just such a competitor that like when I see, like, especially when I take time off or haven't been putting work in like outside of the tables and I, I'm making mistakes and other people are, are, or particular players consistently outplaying me. Like, I just go, you know, what? fuck this guy. Like he's fighting for his lunch money and like, I'm not going to let him have it. Like, and I'm just going to sit there and outwork you until like you're dead, you know? Uh, and that's like, that's like this insanely competitive sort of aspect to my personality that, that has a ton of cons by the way, for your like day to day life. Um, but I think that has really kept me, uh, you know, in poker uh, a long time too. And, and I think that's harder to find if you're like playing like nine handed every day, you know, but I get to battle with, with a few guys shorthanded huge games like somewhat consistently you know and i don't know and, and one or two of them i don't even like so that makes it that much easier <laughs> Ooh. At least, wow. is it a, are we is it a secret who the people they don't like are oh, yeah, i'm not gonna throw people under the bus on your pod that gets way too many viewers but yeah but but with that said almost all the guys who play high stakes in la live i i really really like you know so just uh one or two of them are a little little too slimy a little too thirsty for my liking but yeah I think I might know who one of those people are. I think I might. <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about your live your live at the bike play recently. I, I made a video yesterday. We were texting about it a little bit yesterday, and kind of these recent episodes. Um, you, know, you kind of I, I guess people talk about it, going through a little downswing on the show, or maybe I feel like it's more you're getting into some spots. You're on the other side of variance a little bit when it comes to decisions, whether it's bluffing or calling. When it comes to those type of things like sometimes we just get in spots and and we run bad in them mm -hmm. and uh, i highlighted yesterday about the type of table talk that you've been doing a lot recently yeah. in terms of the negative things that that can do to us as poker players and kind of how it can get into all parts of our poker game and, and really into our life and really be a crippling thing for people out there and it's something i've certainly gone through sometimes it lasts for months and i feel like we don't see many people in poker be willing to even share some type of vulnerability like that. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people out there really enjoy watching you because when we get 
the positive side of things, we get the upswings. Sometimes when the downswings are losing, we're going to get a different, different perspective on things too that other people aren't really willing to get into or share. And I mean, I don't know, I find it quite fascinating. I also find that a great learning experience for other people out there that might be watching. And, and I guess when you see that or and when you kind of look at that and and you take a look back, I know that you put a lot of pressure on yourself to be able to win. I know you put a lot of pressure on yourself when you play these shows to put on a good show and, and to really... I guess, do yourself proud in a lot of ways. And uh, what, what are your kind of thoughts on when you look back and when you kind of see these moments, are you just say, oh, okay, you know, it is what it is. Or are you saying, well, I might want to, I might want to try to avoid doing that in the future. Right. No, no, quite the contrary. Uh, that's okay. No, like I'm uh, incredibly hard on myself, like in every way. Um, so maybe this is like a bit overstated. Um, but no, I'm, I'm like really, really disappointed uh, both with my play and sort of like my behavior, like on the on the stream, like in recent weeks, and probably like most people are like, like who cares? It's no big deal, like whatever. Um, but I just like I take great pride in being like a great ambassador to poker, trying to make the table like super fun for everyone, making sure like the people that aren't doing that professionally are having a good time, and to be honest, making sure the people that are doing it professionally are having a good time, like. I think if you truly believe in your game, like this is kind of like maybe an egotistical thing to say or whatever, but maybe I'm not even saying this about myself in a general sense. If you truly believe in your game, everyone's your customer, you know? Um, and, and I think that just coincides perfectly with like my personality anyway. Like I'm trying to make connections like on the table, off the table. I'm trying to have fun on the table, off the table. So it all kind of just like flows together, but, but kind of going back to your, exact question like i just feel like in recent weeks like i let um a little run bad a lot of play bad like affect me um and i think like uh i'm referring to sort of like a few different areas uh we can start with like just like there's a bit of like whininess to me um when like i've been losing lately and I really had made like great strides in that over the years and, and it's crept back the last few weeks when you're just like you're just getting pounded like hand after hand. Uh, and I just think that's complete garbage. I think it's like not fair to your opponents. I just don't think like uh, it's just like the right way to do it. Like one of my biggest goals when I play poker is to always be really kind to everyone else at the table, unless it's like double A or something like that. And then, you know, then I'll just like at best just ignore them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, uh, like to me that like serves two purposes obviously the primary purpose is like i always like want to treat people with respect and kindness like in my life and again like i think like a lot of people as they get older or maybe they acquire some wealth they start thinking about like some other things because like the money doesn't make you happy you know and you know building connections with others and just treating people well is you know, there's, there's not really anything that like brings more joy to, to my life than that, you know? So we can start there obviously. But the other thing is like, I've noticed a clear correlation that when I'm like treating people kindly, I'm playing better. And like, if I'm like starting and I'm, you know, I'm never just like outright, like being a dick to someone, but I'll start making like snide, sarcastic comments, like things like that. That's like when I'm at higher risk to, to sort of start playing at least to some extent, like not my best poker game. So, you know, like those two things coincide like really well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm losing my train of thought. I'll stop there. It looks like you have something to add to that anyway. So, yeah, I was kind of thinking about, you know, when you texted me yesterday and you mentioned that in terms of in regards to the ta table talk and the way that you were talking and the way that you talk about opponents, it's actually something I hadn't picked up on. But then once you said it to me, and I went back and rewatched it kind of, you know, you mentioned like during the art hand, you said, well, I guess I'll give you credit for having pocket tens here. And when Gary made a kamikaze $45,000 bluff, uh, you know, I think you, you said some other things like that. And that wasn't actually something yeah, I picked up even, on. Yeah. I'm not even considering calling here. Yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. 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 I didn't pick up on that, but you're right. That, that is something that, um, that is something I feel like that can maybe put you in a, I guess like entitlement tilt in a lot of ways where it's like, you feel like you deserve to win or you deserve, you're making the right place. Like how dare somebody be able to, to beat you. And, and yeah, that's a, that's a very big thing. And, and I didn't really pick up on that until you said it, but so you do real, you do notice a correlation between your play and, and your attitude when you don't say things like that compared to when you might be saying things like that to yourself. I think so. I think, uh, 
I think the correlation maybe is, is kind of small, you know, but it's again, like when you think about like the edges available in poker, when I think about how much I put into my poker game, like why would I not be trying to take like every edge I can? Like, obviously when it comes to like, you know, ethical things like that, like, you know, being kind and, and whatever, and helping you to, you know, maybe stay in control that much more. But yeah, I, I, I think your point there is like really well taken where I'm just like, you know, I say something dumb, like art has 40 fucking Queens here, you know, like mm -hmm. just like so sure that like he has a queen so often. And, it, and it's funny, like, just, I mean, I gotta say like the last few weeks have been pretty devastating to me on a professional level. And normally like, I don't really care. Like poker doesn't really bother me like at all outside the, the 30 minute drive home, like from the casino, you know, mm -hmm. but like, it's really taken its toll on me. Uh, and sure playing bad, uh, is, is, a large part of that but i was also just really disappointed sort of with uh you know with with my demeanor and just my attitude in general because um and this is going to probably be a very oversimplified amateur hour way of explaining this but but i'll give it a shot anyway like people just want to be happy right and the word happy so convoluted like whatever but we'll just use it anyway right people just want to be happy while they think money will play a role in making them happy right well, it's like if if in this pursuit of making more money, which, by the way, for me, it does nothing like it doesn't increase my happiness at all. Like I'm like miserable in like or as I have been like at times, at least playing over the past few weeks. Like, how does that serve me? The goal is to be happy. Like, you know, so instead of sort of this mindset of if I win, I'm happy. If I lose, I'm not. I mean, that's just such a, that's just such a recipe for disaster in poker, you know? So I really try and focus on, on other things, you know, uh, like the, the biggest word that I, that comes to mind with this stuff uh, and I use it all the time and it's kind of corny, but it's gratitude. Like I always feel like so incredibly grateful for my life, you know, like starting with my friends and family, like all the way down to like less important things, you know, like, you know, I don't, I don't need to worry about money or things like that. And so, you know, like if I'm playing poker and things aren't going well, and I come from this like gratitude mindset of, you know, like maybe some of these other guys need to win, you know, or maybe they need to like have a big win 100 times in a row to like approach a fraction of the success I've had. Like, I'm so grateful for, for where I'm at. Like this money doesn't matter. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I even have the opportunity to play in the highest stakes poker games. You know, my dad, he uh, he like plays like one, two, no limit hold'em in, in Tucson, Arizona, right? And all of the guys at his casino just like sit and talk to him about me like all the time. And they're huge fanboys and whatever. I say this like only because it's like when I talk to my dad and he's talking about all this stuff, it makes me like so grateful to have reached like the peak of poker, you know? Like when you're there, I feel like a lot of times it's so hard to care. You know, you're always looking for something else, but the reality is, is like, if I look at my poker career when I was 18, like, and, you know, first starting to like play professionally online to think that I'd be where I'm at, it's, it's incredible accomplishment. You know, like whenever I walk into my house, like each day, I'm like, this place is fucking dope. Like, and I heard this shit and I'm so happy, you know, I'm not like, well, fuck, like, I really wish my house was only two blocks from the beach and cost $10 million, you know? And so that's the kind of mindset that I have almost all the time. And so whenever I don't have that mindset, and again, at times they're at the table, I've had that lately, uh, I really beat myself up over it later. So, so why do you think it's been coming up here in, in recent weeks? Do you think it's just tied to losing or do you think it's tied to other factors outside of, outside of that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think, yeah, losing obviously like plays a role in it. You know, like when you're just like losing small pot after small pot or when you're just like, you know, like one day I think I lost like 900 or a thousand bigs or something in a game. And then that's it. Yeah, go ahead. I said, that's it. Uh, yeah. And we were playing like one, two or one, two, four or whatever. And then like the next two, three sessions, I think I lost like 300 bigs each. Like those become like hard to stomach. You know, you're just getting fucking punched in the face every single fucking day. It's mm -hmm. so exhausting, you know? And like in each of those sessions, like I had an opportunity at least to like make a hero play that like, you know, that like would have like gotten me out or would have gotten me like to some extent out. And I feel like that's, that's part of 
the intuition, the intangible, et cetera, that I take like deep pride in. And, uh, you know, maybe some like high stakes guys like hear that and they go, eh, you're a fish. Like what you're talking about is bullshit, you know? But like, I deeply, deeply believe in it that like the truly elite players, when these huge spots come up, they just figure out a way to, to like know the answer. And I'm not talking about hundred percent, but like they get it right or like 60 to 70%. Whereas like, you know, obviously like the other high stakes guys playing against each other, it's more like 50. And, and I don't know that I, there's just, I feel like a natural skill uh, associated with that. But um, again, going back to your question about why do I feel like I've struggled with this um, more recently? Uh, you know, I feel like some of this is, and I love that word you used, entitled. Uh, there's been like an entitlement at times, I feel like that I felt, and maybe Maybe it's from like just running so hot, like recently my whole poker career, you know, that's another thing that I always deeply believe in. And I think is critically important for me is I always believe that I've run in the 1%, uh, uh, like in poker and everything else, but in poker. And when you have this mindset that like, you're just going to run well, I just think it, it's, it's just so incredibly helpful. It doesn't matter if it's true or not like at all, you know? And that's why I think that's a messy thing because it's like, on one hand, it's very important that you understand the concept of variance and like on a very deep level. But on the other hand, I think it's really important that you think positively and you think that you always have run well and you're going to continue to run well. I have some poker friends that think that way. And I just feel like they're much happier people in addition to probably on average better poker players than a couple friends that come to mind that are always like, oh, I run so bad. I run so bad. Like... <laughs> It's, I don't know. It's just, it, and, and maybe you do, by the way, like I'm not discrediting someone who says that, that they don't, you know, maybe they really do, but I just don't think it serves them. And like, I'm all about like, um, sort of like results, right? Like how does this like positively affect your life to be sitting here thinking about how you run so bad? Anyway, I keep going off on tangents back to the entitled part. Right. So you know, someone runs a big bluff on me and like, I, I don't know. I, I just think that it helps a lot. And maybe I haven't done the best job recently of having like a deep respect for all of my opponents, you know, and like when they outplay me in a hand, like just like being more at peace with that, you know, instead of being like, oh, Garrett, like you're better than this guy. Like how, how is he beating you? It's ridiculous. It's the fishiest thought process ever. Like, what is the question I'm asking myself? How did one player beat me in one big hand ever? Mm -hmm. Like, what the fuck? How fucking insane is that? Like, of course I lose like big hands to people all the time, you know? Of course I'm gonna make big, big mistakes and big pots all the time. And I feel like having this like deep respect for your opponents, I think will A, lead me to make better decisions. And B, I think like take a little bit of the weight off like my shoulders, you know? And like, you know, a great example is that one of the hands that you show, the one with Gary, you know? Like calling there with three tens on the river would be ridiculous. It would be fucking insane. And I don't want to go into like too much strategy on it, but it, it would just be absolutely nuts to call there. But I remember in the moment after I was just like, so shook by it. Like Garrett, how the fuck did you misplay another big hand? You know? <laughs> and it, I don't know. I mean, it, it's obviously just a really results oriented, super fishy way of thinking. And so Again, there's this fine line between a like when you play live poker, like just having deep belief that in these very close, tough spots, you're just going to make the right decision more often than not versus B like a hand like where Gary shoved there and you go, you tip your cap, you say great play and you don't even consider like that, like calling there like could have been correct, you know, and in the meta game, well, he would never shove like if he actually had a real hand like or he knows that you think that way and he will shove with the real hand that you, you know, like you just, some, some hands you just got to let go basically. Okay. I'll stop. Go ahead. No, oh, I, I, was, I was enjoy. I always enjoy the paths you go down kid. I feel like you got the game tree in your mind and then you, you got, you form the tree and you got three paths and then you go down these two and you're like, oh, I got to go back down that. Then you fall. Form a six pat, you know what I'm saying? I'm listening that's, that's to the awesome. game, I'm listening to the game tree for him, man. It's all I never know how it's gonna shape shape yeah. out of there. So I'm just, uh, you ask me like a you ask me like a simple one part question, and then I'll give you like one A through D and then two A through C, and then like yeah, it's it's pretty sick, and that's the way my mind works. And obviously, 
it served me well in poker, but again, it makes it very, very hard to live your life with peace and sleep at night and, and things like that. And, and that's why, you know, maybe I spend uh, a little less time in PO than a lot of these up and comers and, and more time in terms of just trying to figure out, you know, some of the bigger questions. More time's getting out of line, Garrett, having a good time getting out there, going to Coachella this weekend, oh, yeah. uh, going to be having a good time kind of, uh, kind of, do you, do you find like moments like this or kind of having fun away from the tables? Do you feel like that helps you like that helps you sort of stay sane in a lot of ways in terms of the mind always working and thinking about so many different scenarios and outcomes and possibilities when it comes to something like poker. And then you can have a little balance where when you go out or when you have a good time, you're not really thinking about poker in the moment you're thinking about, let me have, have fun. And then you, after that ends, you go, okay, let me get back to thinking about poker here. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, I used to be really hard on myself uh, in regards to let's call it just drinking exclusively since drugs are illegal. And so, allegedly I've never taken any drugs. Right. And I used to be really hard on myself, like in the subsequent days, like after, if I wasn't feeling well or wasn't all that productive and I'd be like, why do you do this? Like what, look at how you feel right now. Like this is taking away from whatever goal, but as I've gotten older, I realized like those things have like a very important place in my life, you know? And that like when you're someone as intense as I am, someone who's as much of a perfectionist as I am, you need releases. You know, and so, you know, if you're doing like cocaine, you know, four times a week, that's probably too much uh, of a release. Probably, probably. Uh, you know, if you're if you're going out and getting drunk with your friends, you know, once every two or three weeks, you know, I think that's a that's a sort of different thing uh, entirely. And to me, that served me really well in life. And uh, one thing, a pattern that I've uh, kind of followed, especially the last five years in particular is like I'll, I'll often go on like a trip every four to eight weeks, sometimes as little as a few days, many times two or three weeks. Um, and so I'll use those blocks of time to just be laser focused on professional work, fitness work, etc. And like that allows me to like have a goal, like, okay, here's the goal six weeks from now, you know, like obviously tomorrow I'm going to Coachella. So like, the last you know couple months i've just been like working insanely hard in a bunch of different areas and like coachella is the goal coachella is the the reward both you know and so you get there then you have the time of your life at coachella and then what happens very naturally for me is after i just like lie in my bed for two days straight after i go okay like the last thing i want to do is party more and now i want to like go like do something productive go win you know something you know uh Mm -hmm. So I, I go through these like natural flows that, that tend to work uh, really well for me. And it's why sometimes like you'll see me playing poker a few days a week straight. And, you know, those non poker days, I'm like working really hard on other professional things. Um, and then sometimes you won't see me for a while, you know, because I'm either traveling or taking time off or, or whatever. So to me, that works very, very well. But I know not everyone's like that. I know there's a lot of poker players who just like and very good ones who play poker, same schedule every day, five days a week. And I have like deep respect and admiration for a couple of those guys. Um, but it, it, that's just never going to work for me. For me, it's like I can do that for a while. And then I start to have a series of existential crises where I go, what the fuck? This is the fucking point of my life. Like wake up, go to the gym, eat perfect every day. And then like go, and then what? You know, like mm -hmm. to me, it, it's just like not enough. You know, and so I'm always kind of pushing the limits to find things that bring meaning to my life. And although like probably many people would be like, how the fuck is getting drunk and or allegedly not doing drugs like in a festival? Uh, like, how does that bring meaning to your life? And like, I don't know. The first thing I would say is, well, try it because there's just like I've been looking for what I would just like refer to as fun my whole life. And like nothing really beats festival. It's just so incredible. I could just go on and on forever about how much uh, I just absolutely love it. Um, and two, uh, if you have and you don't like it, like that's cool, you know, like find something else, you know, but uh, but yeah, for me, it's all about just finding, uh, finding new things like that I love. I feel like a lot of people don't put enough time into that. Like they, they put time into some things like making money or whatever, but they don't put enough time into what do I do for fun? What's fun for me? And I think it's like, very important to make like a, a heavy investment in that. So fun for you is festivaling. Fun for you is 
is what else? What else is on the fun list for you? There's so many things. I mean, I love traveling around the world. Like I love going to different cultures. I love like meeting new people in different cultures. Like uh, I'm uh, like an avid outdoorsman, like scuba diving is, is one of my favorite pastimes. I travel all around the world to scuba dive. Uh, I love like nature. So I love hiking in a variety of like um, sort of out there locations skydiving like really anything that like gets your adrenaline pump you know pumping to me like skydiving is similar to like flipping for some huge number you know like it's like a moment of thrill you know and i probably shouldn't flip it probably like is terrible for my life like whatever but like in the end you just like again if you just don't care really like if you win or lose and for that moment you feel alive as fuck like you know it, it has its place um despite it probably on the whole like being much like a, a net negative for my life and for almost everyone else, it's just like a super net negative. So, yeah. But also like, I enjoy things like, you know, just sitting at home, like watching movies, TV shows. Like I I'm a big fan of, of movies and TV. And, and, and so I watch a lot of shows and I would say like in my early twenties, maybe even up to my late twenties, I like really didn't watch too much TV. I would like guilt trip myself into always reading, just always reading nonfiction, personal development, whatever. And in recent years, like I'll do some of that, but sometimes I go, you know, what? like, I don't know. I, I like Netflix, you know? And so, so I'm, I'm more at peace with that where I know a lot of super high achievers just like are allergic to the television. You know, I would oh, yeah. say, give it a shot. It's kind of fun sometimes. Just turn your brain off, you know? Yeah, I, I found that lately I've been using TV as a way to, whenever I'm like overthinking something in my mind, which is always, but whenever I'm like, it's really loud and I'm starting to get anxious, I go, I watch TV, I get in the foam roll or I'll do, I do some yoga. Uh, my, by yoga, I mean stretch. And then, yeah, I always start to feel better. So that's been my kind of release in a lot of ways is just to turn the brain off because it's always always in like a i don't even know what shape it's in it's always in a shape so yeah i agree with you on the television thing but a lot of high achievers do constantly talk about how tv is bad and i can understand that because people maybe watch one show and then they watch 100 episodes and then maybe they don't do it. you know so i can understand how it can snowball and, and get out of line pretty fast but everything is, everything is balance you know like I, i've struggled more than almost anyone i know with balance in my life and again i'm slowly trying to make some strides in it but the reality is is like if i wake up at 8 a.m train in the gym for two hours, like, and then I'm doing like another 10, 12 hours of productive shit thereafter. Like now more than ever, I, I look back at that day and go, win. I fucking crushed today. Now I'm like super at peace, like watching a movie for the last couple hours before I go to bed, you know? And I feel like if one is unable to do that, if they're like feeling very guilty about, um, in TV, it doesn't need to be TV. It could be anything that they don't believe to be a worthwhile sort of way to spend your time, let's say. Like, if you're just never at peace with that, like, I just think, like, it, it's just going to be very hard to, to to smile all that much. So. We got we got a comment in the chat. Vinny Stack says, G-Man's the GOAT and consequently one of my frat brothers from college. He was a sophomore when I was a freshman. Nicest dude ever and just a general good dude. Shout out to Vinny Stacks. Nice. Yeah, I know who that is. <laughs> Good guy. Anyone with a name like Vinny Stacks is usually really out of line. That's what I've come to find out in my in my life. Yeah, it's, dude, it's crazy how many people play poker. Like, I was playing at live at the bike like last week, and this uh, this friend of mine from from growing up comes up to me, and I'm like, "What are you doing here?" He's like, "Yeah, I'm a professional poker player. Like, I grind all the casinos in LA. I've lived here a few years. Just like, it's just crazy how many people are either professional poker players or." We're trying to be professional poker players. Um, again, it, it just makes me feel like very, very grateful um, for the for the position I'm at. You know, yeah, I think some, some, it's easy to lose that perspective, though, because when you've been playing for so long and when you've gotten to a certain level of poker and certain entitlement, uh, which you might say, and then you see how many others are out there who are trying to get to that level or they dream about being a professional poker player. Or they dream about getting up from two five from mid stakes to to play high stakes, and then I think it's very easy to lose that perspective, especially when a lot of your other poker friends also play very high stakes too. So you kind of get out of touch with, oh wow, like there are thousands of people around the world, and nope. almost in every country around the world, that their actual dream is to be in this position, yeah. and, and that's a pretty crazy thing to think about. Yeah, it's, I mean it's crazy. Like you'll see, like you know, I'll watch some of your podcasts with people; they'll get like a hundred thousand views. 
I'm like a hundred thousand. Like to me, that's just like a mind blowingly large number in terms of like, okay, well the people watching this podcast, you know, as, as much as everyone loves you, is still only a, a small fraction of the total number of people who, you know, are either uh, recreational poker players or aspiring professionals. Like it's just insane. Like how many people are trying to, trying to climb and, and whatever. And it, it, it's just like another reminder for me, especially when I do take time off, like I'm like, you know, the, the four guys I'm battling with regularly, like, you know, they're out there working hard every day and let alone the other million, five million, whatever guys, like they're out there, they want it bad, you know, like, and, and so it's like either, either move on to something else or, or continue to just work out, work out, work everyone alive, you know, like as I've looked for purpose in my life, um, just like having like a sickening work ethic has been like one of the best ways, like I find meaning in my life as, as I don't know, trivial as it sounds, like if you're going to do shit in life, like to me, like, why wouldn't you just be the absolute best at it? Like you're, you're only awake, like so many hours anyway, you might as well, you know, like, and I get it. Like, let's say you're, you have a family, you want to spend time with them, like whatever. But like, if you're just out there like dicking around and like, you're, you're not like the uses of your time day to day, like you're not really finding much meaning. Like why not just like dedicate everything to, to being great at things, you know, like one thing you, you always hear people say, right. Is they go, there's not enough time in the day. I've always felt the exact opposite actually. And I guess that maybe is not quite as uncommon for poker players who make their own schedule or whatever. But I always think days are so incredibly long and like many days to, to fill 16 hours to me seems like kind of a daunting challenge. So for instance, like spending two of that in the gym each day, that's, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. You know, it's only two hours. Like I have a great time doing it. Like, let's go from there with the other 14. If it's something you really want, you know, mm -hmm. that's, and you know, it's not like I really want 10 different goals or whatever. There's only like three or five or, you know, whatever things I really focus on. But, uh, you know, I think some of the best moments of my life and best times in my life are when I'm just like aggressively pursuing a goal. Uh, one of my favorite books, it's called The Happiness po Hypothesis. And one of like the main uh, theses in the book is something referred to as the progress principle, right? And the progress principle essentially just argues that like, uh, like achieving a goal is cool. It's often kind of underwhelming even at the end, but the process of grinding away, like running towards it is like the best feeling in the world, you know? So for me, like the secret sauce to living like a meaningful life for me is to always have things I'm running towards. And when I get there, it's critically important that I pick a new one and it can't just be random, right? Cause if you don't truly believe in what you're chasing after, it's just not going to happen. So I, I think, people investing a ton of time into what do I really want? Um, and then just running full speed at it. Uh, I mean, to me, that's, that's just like, that's when I'm, you know, uh, at my most content. I guess the challenge is figuring out what you really want then. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely the trick. It seems like you have a pretty good idea of what it is that you really want to be doing. Uh, yes and no, you know, obviously there's many times I like want to quit poker entirely. Like, you know, you'll, you'll go, there's no big games for a while. Every time you go, it's like nine handed 20, 40, you know, and you're like, what the fuck is this? Like what, this is the lamest thing ever. Like, there's just no way I'm going to do this 2000, a thousand, even 500 hours, like a year. There's just, there's just no way. Like I'm never going to enjoy this, you know? And then a bunch of big games will pop up, you know? And then I'm playing like two, four, four, eight, like whatever, like three handed, like, you know, many, many days in a month. And then, you know, then I'm like, all right, well, this is actually the greatest thing in the world, you know? Cause I mean, to me, that really is like, obviously like you can, you know, if you're, if you're winning, like the amount of money you can win when you're playing like nosebleed shorthanded poker is insane, but even irrelevant of that, it's just like, it's my favorite thing in the world to do. I just absolutely love it. And uh, it reminds me of like when I was younger and would just battle like all of the best, like high stakes, heads up players like online, probably to my own detriment. It was just, I never had more fun in my life. than just six tabling like some superstar at like stakes that probably were too high for me, you know? And I'm just like, my whole body's like sweating. I'm just stressed the fuck out. And you're just like in the zone for like hours straight. Like the mental stimulation there, it's like, it's like a drug that I've never, I've never experienced, you know? And, and so to some extent you get that like playing high stakes, shorthanded line. 
Do you get that feeling doing anything else right now? Um, it's a different kind of feeling. You know, I wouldn't say there's any sort of anything I do that, like you get that exact feeling. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I get it. I get why I keep playing poker, you know, cause it's, it, it's still like, you know, it still does something for me that, uh, that I've never found with anything else. You know, one of my favorite, uh, writers, his name is Mark Manson. Uh, he wrote, uh, I think it's called the art of not giving a fuck. Um, and he, he just, also wrote, he also wrote my favorite book of all time models approaching one with honesty. My favorite book I've ever read in my life. I've recommended it to 1000 people, I think in my life. Right, so yeah, so you're familiar with this guy. He's obviously wrote a million awesome blog posts. He travels all around the world. Like he's a personal hero of mine for sure. And like, I mean, I could reference a million of his articles, but like one of them that always stuck with me is he's like, not sure what the fuck to do with your life. He goes, when you go sit down on your computer or phone, you're just dicking around. Where's the first place you go? For me, the answer. Porn. What? Porn. Yeah, of course. But, you know, like as, assuming like you're done with, with that uh, for five, ten minutes, right? Where are you going next, right? To me, it was always two plus two. Like two plus two is like such a waste these days, right? It's all just like random bullshit, spam, like whatever. But I still just like always follow it, you know, like. I like still like grind so many podcasts and like all these other things because like, even if I don't want to admit it, sometimes I fucking love poker. I fucking love the poker world. And although in a bit of a contradictory, but hopefully understandable way in terms of me, like almost always recommending people run as far away as they can from it, poker for me personally continues to bring so much meaning to my life has done so much good for my life. Um, and, and I'm just like deeply, deeply grateful for it. Uh, and, and again, that's the mindset I almost always have. And, and you know, the one I'm disappointed in if, if I ever kind of shy away from that. So he says that the, the, the first thing that you go to is something that you should try to have more in your life or, or what's kind of the, the way that he explains it then. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that exact article was more just like kind of brainstorming, like what to do. Oh, ideas. Okay. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely like I've always felt really strongly. It's so important that your life is not just poker. And like, even like the extent matters. Like if, if your life is like 90% poker and like 10%, like whatever else, I just still think you're just like drawing stone dead to like live with peace. You know, I have many poker friends where, um, that's kind of the mindset. Just everything is about poker all the time. And so when that's not going well, their entire life isn't going well, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag because like that was my life for many years. And that was when I was just like working so insanely hard on poker, you know, every second of every day from 2003 to, you know, 2000, I don't know, to Black Friday, I guess, basically. Um, and, once you can step away from that and find more balance, uh, yeah, like your poker game might suffer a little bit, but you just live with like so much more peace that, you know, that's, I mean, obviously I just keep repeating a lot of the same shit, but I just feel like that's so, so important, you know, uh, for you feel like, you, feel like you repeat a lot of these things because you're repeating them yourself to constantly remind yourself to sort of you know, have that perspective and look at it this way. Oh yeah. 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 That's a great point. Uh, because, I may spout off like a bunch of like bullshit or whatever, but it's, it's definitely like important for me to remember. And, you know, I'll, I'll say to your viewers, like, I don't have this shit figured out, like not even close to close, you know? And so like life is always like, you know, like a work in progress, like you're always a work in progress. And so I don't have these things figured out. Like I'm trying my best each day to try and like live with more peace, but it's, it's not easy. Uh, and, you know, like it's, it's always going to be challenged. And I think it's always going to be a challenge for, uh, for someone with, you know, with my kind of mindset. And, you know, I think about some of the pods that you've done. Like, uh, I remember the one like with Nick Shulman, that was like one of my very favorite ones where he talked about like his mental health issues and things of that nature. Uh, and I've never struggled, um, with things to that extent. I've never, you know, been on medicine or suicidal or anything like that, but like just to, to hear pe someone just be so open uh, about like their struggles when like, it seems like to the outside world, like things are just like, you know, it, it's Nick Shulman. Like he's got to be the happiest fucking guy in the world. You know, it's, 
I don't know. It's it makes it, it gives me like I feel supported almost, even though like you know I've never even met Nick actually, like because it's like he struggles too, like everyone struggles too, you know. And I feel like maybe I'm just like a bit more open about it than than the typical person who's just like I got everything figured out. I'm super happy, you know. I'm great at poker, like all of these things. A lot of people like say out loud, you know. To me, those are often like just like deep insecurities. Uh, and I would rather just throw it all out there. And if anything, just like over exaggerate the struggles I have over exaggerate, like, you know, the, the poor decisions I make in poker, because like for a million reasons, first of all, you just look like a jackass. Like if you have like positive things to say about yourself, you know, but like beyond that, like if you're trying to make a connection with others, like Joey, if you and I are just meeting right now, you know, and I come up to you and like, I go, honestly, like, I think I'm kind of like the best poker player in the world. Any night I go out, I could probably pull any girl I want and on and on and on. Like if I were to say something like that, like, are you going to like me? Is that going to make, like, is that going to help us to form a connection? No, like that's not human nature. It would intrigue me. It would, it would intrigue you. Okay. Yeah. Cause all right. Someone who would say something like that is just so fucking over the top that you don't even care. Right. But like in general, like that puts people on the defensive, right? They're going to be like, they immediately form a comparison they go, fuck. Maybe this guy makes more money than me. Maybe he's better with girls than, you know, and it's like a competition. Whereas like, if you're just like way more self-deprecating, way more down to earth, like that's how you form a connection with other people. And again, going back to what I've already talked about, to me, that's like, that's the secret sauce for life is building connections. And, uh, you know, so I guess my hope for people in general is like to, to try and let that guard down uh, maybe try and take a deep look inward when they just say things like I'm the best at something, you know, like I don't know Ryan Reese, but that's when that like strikes me as an example where he won the main event. He goes, I'm the best player in the world. Like mm-hmm. I heard that, like it didn't make me mad, but I felt just really sad for him. You know, I was like, this guy's clearly struggling to say something just so incredibly douchey. You know? So what did what I think? Like? Isn't that insane? Did he really say like it almost doesn't even seem possible that someone wins the main event and then says I'm the best player? Like how? Uh, that's insane. That's why like even if you ask me like are you the best player in a nine-handed lineup, let alone the world? Honestly, I don't have any fucking idea. You can't know. You can think, but you can't know. You know. And so, you know. With that said, I think having deep belief in your poker game. Uh, whether justifiable or not is a critically important skill to success. Uh, you can't know you're the best, you know, but so I feel like just generically believing in yourself, believing in your lines, that that's always, I, I think, played a, a major role in my success, you know, because I'm just doing so much ridiculous shit. And if I don't really believe in it, I'm just going to be like very trigger happy, right? Whether it's, you know, a bluff or a call or a fold or, or anything else. I think you need that. (laughs) Sorry, a little echo. I think it might be from your end. I don't really know what's happened. Do you hear any echo, Garrett? People in the chat hear the echo. Um, I don't hear an echo on either end. No. I don't know. This is what Google Hangout does sometimes. It just gives you a random echo. But I do think that that self-belief in poker is very important. And it's something that a lot of... I mean, I think it's a big thing that separates mid-stakes and high-stakes players is that a lot of the high-stakes guys have an abundance of self-confidence in themselves and belief in themselves to overcome downswings, to overcome challenges, to overcome uh, great players. Whereas a lot of people that I've worked with at mid-stakes or smaller stakes, they they greatly lack belief in different areas of those things. And I, I mean, I don't know if you have, if like, if you can, if you can say that about yourself and you think that the results back it up and you think the the ability and the work that you put in back that up. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing to have when it comes to poker because yeah, I mean, I don't know. You kind of, you sometimes you need a little ignorant self-confidence in a lot of different things. And, uh, and yeah, I feel like poker it, it certainly helped by having a little bit of ignorant self-confidence. Although I'm sure that sent a lot of people broke out there too, because they don't quite know the, you know, they don't quite know when they should have less self-confidence and actually imp- try to improve at the game and, and study more. And, and it's not just the result of, of variance that the winning that they've been having. Yeah, no, I mean, spot on. It's just a mind fuck. And I really don't have any like advice on that. Like you just somehow have to figure out how to just think you're the fucking man in Houston, but also like figure out areas you can get better, figure out things your opponents are doing better than you, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's almost like two separate parts of the brain. You have to be incredibly rational 
to figure out how to improve your play. And you have to be incredibly irrational and just be like, whatever, I'm the man, you know? So, I mean, cause it's pretty hard to even like, even if you had like a bunch of data that proved you were the best or something. Uh, and I guess you could, if you were like Doug Polk 2012, I guess there's actual data and a whole bunch of things that would support it. But like in high stakes live poker, you, you don't really know. No one really knows. I certainly do everything I can to like, you know, keep my results private from, from my peers, you know? Uh, so no one really knows about success, let alone like how much that success correlates to poker skill anyway. But so you, you just don't worry about it. Just believe, just like, don't worry about if you're running good or bad, you know, just assume you're running good. Just keep pushing forward, you know? I've always assumed I ran pretty good. I always I always say that. But then when I then when I run bad, I, I notice I get, I go in Garrett mode where I start I start swearing. I saw some of that video yesterday. I'm like, man, I, it's like that session when you when you load up a session and you're like, all right, I'm gonna. And then the first hand you get it all in as a favorite, you lose, and you're like, oh, man. Sorry, man, dude, that's happened so much to me lately. Like I played I played some dumb hand. Like uh, it's a it's like the very first hand of the stream, and I just been fucked up the last like three weeks. Uh, and and I play like like the 10 8 off in some spot where i should just fold it you know but i i just like you know have no discipline pre-flop and you know maybe maybe it's okay maybe it's terrible nobody really knows uh and the flop just comes like you know uh the the queen jack nine you know and and i just get uh and i double up like you know some guy i shouldn't you know as the king 10 uh and it's you're just like here we motherfucking go again <laughs> you know like here and in that moment like I'm not like I've certainly run in the 1% overall in my career. I'm not thinking about that. I'm putting it. I'm, I have a container, but it's a container that begins with the losing streak and is continuing on indefinitely. Right. So the only thing I can see right now is like me, me playing bad, me running bad, like whatever with, with no end in sight, you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it is quite a battle. Uh, and I know you had, uh, you had Dan Zach on recently and, uh, and try and take a little something away from all of these just super geniuses that that you you have these podcasts with. And one thing he said is, uh, you know, the poker table is a battle with yourself. And, and I really, really love that. Um, and, you know, especially in my case, like if someone's like playing or trying to play a bit more of a GTO oriented style and they're playing nine handed and whatever, they always or often will have a series of sort of ways to justify their decisions, right or wrong, probably right, right? But so much of what I'm doing is just so fucking ridiculous that it's really hard, really, really hard at the end of a session for me to go back and be like, you know, good, bad, like whatever. Uh, you know, I use actually a little mental framework that maybe people will use. I just create a five point scale. I think about all of the most interesting or misplayed or whatever hands I played each session. And I'll just go one to five. One being like, that was fucking terrible. Five being like, that was perfectly fine. And then, you know, and then I just pick a number. Uh, and then I just kind of like, if it's like a four for sure, I don't worry about it. If it's like a three even, usually I'm fine. But it's the ones and twos that I spend some more time thinking about and thinking like, you know, how can I do it better? Um, you know, what, what mistakes did I make there? But the reality is, is that's an incredibly imperfect science. Like when I'm doing just so many like ridiculous things, like I don't in the end really know. I'm kind of just like, you know, guessing to the best of my ability. And and this is coming from someone like, again, who who believes in, in his game quite a bit. So I can only imagine if you're just like a mid stakes player, you know, who's like has an average amount of confidence in their game and they do something against the grain. Like they just, I wouldn't even know how they would even begin to analyze that play, you know, except talk to one of their mid stakes friends. It's probably no better at poker than them. And like, it's probably not going to have anything new to add to it, you know? So it's, I don't know. It's, when, when you really think about it, poker is just, it's just, it's just awesome. It's just the most fascinating thing ever. Uh, the variance is fascinating. The gamble aspect, which is obviously what's been the lifeblood of poker forever. Whereas obviously something like chess has no chance of ever being played for any amount of money. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just awesome. But uh, again, that's because I run in the 1%. So. I agree. I think poker is pretty awesome. I definitely agree with you. I've always <laughs> loved it, loved the battle, loved the challenge. I didn't realize it was a mental challenge against myself. I remember me and Dak talk, talked about that. Me and Dan talked about that on Autoline at the Bike 
my former Monday night show that does not exist anymore because of it's all because of Trelly's father. Trelly's father. Trelly's fa father. Uh, he works at the or he golfs at the Newport Country Club, and I guess Trelly's father was uh, golfing with the the owner of the bicycle casino, and then he mentioned that he mentioned this. You know, his son uh, his son had a bad experience on a line at the bike. And um, it thought it might ruin his essential oil business that he had. So I guess something happened with Aaron. This he is put a, in the call. A true story. I mean, I really don't know if you're trolling right now. That's a true story, yeah. Uh, okay, I, I still don't know. But if that's a true story, that blows my fucking mind. It's not. Okay. I'm kidding. It's not. It's not a true story. No. I, mean, it really, I really wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past me. You know, like I've like seen like you know, Torelli brings like an entourage of friends, family, like whatever, and a few of the live of the bike games we played. So. It wouldn't shock me if it, you know, his dad just like, you know, hit their best friends and just he's got his back and he's on you, Joey, you know. But, they made me buy it. They actually made me purchase this this essential oil necklace yeah. as a going away gift sort of thing like that. So listen, of course I gave it away at the end way. I gave a couple of shots. We got a lot of people in the chat. We got a lot of hardcores out there. My boy Digital Fox in the chat. What's up, Digital Fox? Man, I always appreciate digital with your with your uh with your amateur Photoshop that you do and post on two plus two. I got a lot of love for you, Digital Fox. Must Love my friend, much love, man, much love. I got, I saw, uh, who do I see out there, man? Wayne Chiang, my guy, Wayne. What up, Wayne? Patrick from Live at the Bike. What up, Patrick? What's happening, brother? What else we see out there, man? I saw Israeli Ron in the chat. What's up, Mr. Israeli Ron? Queen Deuce offsuit, Queen Deuce suited. My buddy Ryan Marks, of course, is out there. Ryan says, what did Ryan say? Ryan said, I'm gonna use restroom. Garrett's gotta go pee. We'll get some more shout outs here. Garrett's taking the GTO piss over there. What did Ryan say? I don't know. Ryan said something about Garrett being one interesting motherfucker out there. Man. Who else we got in the chat, man? James Rosenthal. What's up, Big Poppy? What's happening, brother? Let me ask this question. We record it so I, so I uh, have it written down here when he comes back. Who else we got out there? Mr. Grimstar. What up, Grimstar? What's happening, Big Poppy? What's going on, brother? Matt Taylor. What up, Poppy? Joe Canedo. What up, Canedo? End line. Adrian Jimenez, Matt Taylor, what's up, Matt? Zachary Weatherford, what's up, Zach? Alex Babbitt, Joe, I said that name already. I'm so GTO. Mark Martin, Mark Martin, also Polky Vlogger. What's up, Mark Martin, also Polky Vlogger? What's happening, buddy? Zachary Weatherford, I already mentioned that name too. My buddy Jack, as always. What up, Jack? Beautiful face, Jack. I'm liking that avatar you got there, Jack. I like looking at your face over there, Jack. Looks good. Kachishti. I'm not from India. What's up, Poppy? I know I didn't say your name right. What's done in the dark? Stugats. What's happening, brother? Scott Headley. What's up, Scott? My buddy Cam. What up, Cam? What up, big Poppy? What's happening, man? Lee Davies. Riddle me that. You got a shout out to give Garrett? You got? A, you want to give a shout out to somebody out there? I'm, I'm good. I'll skip on that. No <laughs> shout outs. Glenn Roberts. What up, big Poppy? Poppy. It's crazy. I haven't learned any new Spanish in four years, Garrett. I feel like you feel like my Spanish would evolve, but I still know the same. I still know the same hundred words of Spanish. Colombian cocaine. What's up, cocaine? What's up, happening, buddy? How many of those words are even real words? Like 10, 15 percent of them. I don't think about things like that, Gert. I don't think about trivial things as sort as like am I saying actual words or not? I mean, it, it seems more fun to just make up words than than say actual words. You know what I'm saying? I, I think it's cool. I think it works for you. I mean, you've you've developed like quite a quite a cult following. Like not in just in terms of people, but just like behaviors right like at the poker table like people refer to each other as poppy and what, <laughs> what? really <laughs> yeah, uh, the word allegedly is just like now like just part of almost every poker player's syntax like when it never was before you know uh your your influence uh, uh culturally socially really in a multitude of different ways i think it's, it's far reaching than you could ever know that's crazy I mean, I, I, I've thought about, like, people say the great game of Pop Little Omaha. We turned it in. We turned uh, a game, Pop Little Omaha, into the great game of Pop Little Omaha. Oh, yeah. and so many guys are like, why do you only play two-card PLO? You know, like, I mean, there's just you, – you had to have invented that, right? Like, I mean, I only hear it from you, you know, so – I'm I'm the only person I've ever heard say that, so I don't know if anyone else says that. There you go. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I've, I've always been good at that since I was like eight years old. I've just made up sayings or made up phrases or words and like said them repetitively. And then like they catch on and people start calling like I've given people nicknames that stuck for like all entire grade school back in the day. And even when I was, you know, turned 19, 18 and would give my friends nickname like Creepy Matt. Shout out to Creepy Matt. And uh, yeah, everyone just called him Creepy Matt. I mean, another one that you use that I love is receipts. That shit is so funny, too. There's so many of these things. Honestly, I've stolen from you, too, you know? Friend will tell you a story about like a wild night he had. I'm like, dude, 
I need a fucking receiver. I'm not going to believe this. Like, Seriously. It's just hilarious. Like, I don't, I don't know where you come up with this stuff. Uh, receipts was what definitely came up because uh, you mentioned like where do you go to first uh, and when you open up the phone I always go to the hip hop message forums like I I think I know more about hip hop and rap culture and that world than I might know about poker which is going to be insane to believe I think I could do a I think I could do a rap podcast right now and it would be it would be a, a, an amazing podcast but they I was not going to Coachella this year man like the lineup for Coachella is like so rap heavy it's like insane like man it's not a lot bro I'm telling you man I'm, I get out of line I'm trying to be in line with my life Garrett you know me you see me out of line I get out of line see, I, I'm trying to be good I'm trying to be I'm trying not to you know I get a little carried away sometimes when I go out I do I you know and I go through I go through phases like that too where like I just I'm like I'm just saying like hard no to all drinking activities for a week straight so I get it I get it good you you see actually witness that before so i was like okay you know yeah i could uh i don't know it gets crazy fast but yeah they say receipts over there a lot they're like someone says something like man i want to see the receipts bro because it's like a forum claim you make a claim and someone's like all right bro give me some fucking proof yeah yeah receipts is a great thing too and i mean it's been so many people in poker before it's not as much anymore because because there's not as much you know online sort of aspect of things but so many people be like oh i'm winning online i'm like man let me see the fucking receipts man show me the graph show me something like let me see something here so Dude, the internet's a really funny place. I, I grind like a bunch of Reddit threads like related to electronic music and shit. Like people are just really, really funny on the internet. I I've stolen all kinds of funny things from it. Like everyone's like kind of nerdy as fuck, but also really funny, you know? And I think that's kind of how uh yeah, I've like relished that in myself too. Like I used to try and kind of just be like the, the cool dude, like the cool frat guy, like whatever, you know, and would hide the intellectual intellectual aspects of myself because like you know, when you're 19 years old, what kind of sorority girls give a fuck about that, you know? Uh, but as I've gotten older, like, yeah, I'm a nerd. Like, I love to read. Like, you know, like, I sit and cruise Reddit. Like, whatever. I don't care. What's your favorite Reddit sub forum? Yeah, probably Reddit slash Raves. That's that's one I grind the most just because I, I love reading about uh, electronic music. Um, so, little Blue Light. <laughs> I've spent some time on Blue Light. You know that one or what? I do not know blue light. No, my, my favorite one is conspiracy. Drugs, so that's why. Oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Blue light. No, I do not know blue light. Okay. Drugs are always really interesting to me. So I love reading about them. And, you, know. you know, it's funny. I, I actually messaged you and I messaged my friend Ryan coincidentally enough in the chat because I, I, I said that I started doing uh, cause, uh, edibles, uh, marijuana legal here in Las Vegas. So I purchased some of these edibles. Actually, I have a pack right here, presently enough. But I, uh, and then I, I messaged my friend Ryan, I messaged you. I was like, what do you guys do when you take edibles? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. I've never really had much experience with it. So I, uh, yeah. What do you do when you have edibles? What do you think, Garrett? Cause I, I don't know. I don't know. What, what's the G what do you like? What do you supposed to like? I, I don't, I don't do to be honest. I don't really love like edibles like that much. And in general, I've never loved weed. Like, I think it's fine, but I don't know, like compared to, to other like uppers and shit, like, I don't know. It just doesn't do it for me, even compared to alcohol. I have a, a funny story. Like my girlfriend last week was like, all right, I just got these new edibles, like for the first half of one of the days of Coachella, like, let's just do that, you know? And I was like, eh, I just never really like, like, edibles that much. like whatever. She goes, all right. I was like, fuck it. All right. Let's like, let's run a test. So it's like, it's like a random Wednesday night at like 10 PM or whatever, you know? And so she makes me take like a lot, like, uh, like what, whatever this edible thing is. Right. Uh, and you know, like, obviously it takes a while, 60, 90 minutes later, I'm just like stoned out of my mind and I just don't really like it that much. Like I felt like a little bit anxious, like it was just like a little bit too much, you know? And then I have another, I have another good story for you related to, uh, to weed. This one's pretty strong. All right. So I'm playing in this, uh, huge high stakes, uh, huge high stakes game. Right. And, um, me and. Ah, should I use these people's names? Nah, fuck it. I don't think it really matters that much. So anyway, so like the game's kind of slow, like whatever. And uh, Chris Smith is in this game. You know who that is? Mm -mm. Uh, all right, whatever. Anyway, so he plays like some high stakes games or whatever. And then I was like, dude, I can out drink you. Like, and he's like, all right, let's go drink for drink right now. And I was like, eh, I don't think so. Like only if a couple other guys get in on it. So Ozzy Mac gets in on it. Uh, Prahlad like sits on like one little glass of wine pretending like he's drinking with us. Uh, next thing I know, like, we're all just fucking hammered. I'm like, I don't know, probably like 15 shots deep, something like that. Every time, like, the waitress comes around, it's like two more shots of tequila each. Then that would have been like, whatever, you know, like, 
I've got at least a chance, like drunk, to, to win playing poker. Then Perlaud has like this liquid weed thing, right? And he goes, Garrett, you should try this shit, man. You're really going to like it, you know? And I'm just hammered drunk, so I'm like, ah, whatever, you know? And so he like fills it up all the way. He goes, take a full swig of this shit, you know? Uh, and I'm like, all right, fuck it. You know, I'm hammered, so I take it. And like I'm literally just like catatonic after that. Like can't move. Like I don't even remember like really much of anything. Like I don't remember if I played any hands. I can, what the fuck? <laughs> I, seriously, I can, and oh, we're playing like really, really big. <laughs> like these are the kind of moments where I go, what, what is the point of my life right now? You know, this is insane. Uh, I'm like in the bathroom every few minutes, just like hurling up, like whatever you know, crossfade between the alcohol and weed is, and it's just. It's just this like complete disaster of a night. So anyway, I feel like these couple bad experiences with weed have always kind of uh, have made me not love it quite so much. But and you, and you won four hundred thousand in that game, huh? No, I, I lost a huge number. Big shock, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, to be honest, I'm starting to wonder if Pilat maybe he did that on purpose. I'm sure. I'm sure he didn't. I'm sure. I'm sure his intentions were incredibly honest, but. Fun stuff, and obviously, like I'm a grown man, and I'm gonna make my own choices, and plenty of time they're gonna be fucking terrible choices, and and, and that's okay. You learn from them, and, and you have fun with it. And I feel like if I'm sitting here today, like so mad that like I probably lit many, many, many dollars on fire by those choices, or if I just laugh about it and I go, man, I can be a real fucking dumbass and then move forward. Like I just rather have that attitude. I'm pretty sure Perlot is a very experienced veteran with um with the marijuana, so maybe to him that wasn't a lot, but to uh to someone mixing it. But he did, it could have been. I don't know. I also know Perlot. Shout out to Perlot. Yeah, he, uh, he's a legend of the poker world. I've had him on the podcast before too. He uh he's obviously played a lot of live games. He's got a little hustle to him too. So I'm sure. No, come on. All right. Maybe, <laughs> maybe right, maybe right. No, but like like I said, like. In the end, like I'm a grown man, like I make my own choices. Like that story wasn't to like throw him under the bus, you know, like a grown man offers another grown man weed. He can choose to either have it or not, you know, like that's true. If someone offers, if someone offers me cocaine and I do cocaine, I can't be like, well, I got for me cocaine. It's like, I, I did the cocaine. It's like you, you choose to do what, what it, you, what you allegedly, want to do, so. actually, that's never actually happened to you, but yeah, allegedly. Yeah, I got to ask about this, Gary. Okay, so I mean, I think we talked about this before on I Line the Bike Show, but a lot of people always mention about the eyes and 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 are you on are you on a thousand milligrams Vaterol or anything like that? Can we can we talk about this a little bit? So is is that a big thing in your part of your game, or is it just your eyes are are that intensely focused? Because people ask me this all the time. I'm like, that's just how his eyes look. I don't know. I've never seen him with different eyes. Like I don't. It's what yeah, I don't I mean, look like here. No, like I never take Adderall to play poker. Um, I will take Adderall, probably I shouldn't say this out loud, but whatever. I'll take Adderall to party like once every three months or whatever, which is which is uh, when mixed with alcohol, a hell of a combination, by the way. Um, but no, I never take Adderall to play. Uh, occasionally, like if I've been playing a ton of hours, I'll, you know, start downing coffee. Um, but I don't, I don't know why that is. That's just like the way my eyes are. Um, I definitely, when I'm playing my best and paying attention to what's going on, that's part of it. Uh, I guess one other thing I could add to that is like, I think direct eye contact in poker is super fucking awkward. So, you know, I'm one of those fish that like believe that there are things I can pick up on my opponents by taking a look at what they're doing, but I don't want to be fucking in some, uh, shout out to Fader Holtz, who's probably the world's best player and a genius. And he's taught me so many things about life and poker from your podcast but I'm not going to, you know, do this, the fucking, you know, stare right into another man's soul sort of thing. Like it's kind of the opposite of what I'm looking to do. I'm trying to come across as least intimidating as possible at the poker table. So I think sometimes that's maybe why my eyes dart because I want to see what they're doing, but I certainly don't want to be fucking staring at them. That's, that's my best guess, but mostly it's probably just because I'm a weirdo. And I think once you start watching yourself on any sort of camera, that's been a process for me because like, even like when I was on survivor and whatever, every single scene, I'm just like, this guy's such a douche. Why does he look like that? Why does he have these terrible facial expressions? Why does he talk so feminine? Why is his fucking voice so loud, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course I'm referring to myself when I think about all these things, you know, and then over time you see yourself on camera enough. You just like, you're like, all right, whatever. That's just me. <laughs> I'll deal with it. 
Yeah. So what do you think about watching, watching back the show on live at the bike, dealing with the fans of the show or the comments people from make from the show, whether it's good plays or bad plays or admiration or, or negative things they have to say, how do you sort of take all that in? Um, could you rephrase that? I think I know what you're asking, but not totally sure. So how does it make you feel to, to experience and deal with what comes with along with playing on the show and becoming a personality in poker and becoming someone that fans look up to or talk shit about or talk shit about the plays or love the plays or and that aspect of things? Sure, yeah. Uh, a few things I could say about that. Uh, for one, um, I try and work really hard about on like not caring. Uh, I think like when you care about that kind of stuff, it can only kind of have negative impact and negative impact on, on your play, you know? So I feel like if anything, it's gonna make people less gun shy. It's gonna make people less willing to make plays that are again, very heroic. And by heroic, I mean, just sort of very against what you would assume most good players would do. Very atypical plays, which of course is, it has always been sort of uh, you know a central piece of my poker game. So I try and tune all of that out. Um, with that said, um, the positive attention at times uh, is nice. It's, it's nice. You know, I think as a poker player, um, you're almost, it becomes instinctive if, if, if you are a professional in any like sense of the word, that you always want to be downplaying your skill and your talent and your threat level and all of these sort of things. So basically the opposite of what I looked for my whole poker career, certainly my whole live poker career, actually even going back to heads up online, right? Cause I didn't want people to think I was good then, uh, is always just like, uh, not looking for prestige, quite the opposite. Right. Um, but so, so being on these streams and shows and stuff like getting that is, it's kind of nice because like you just I've never gotten it, you know, and one of the key tenets of like one's job satisfaction is sort of approval from your peers, recognition for good work, et cetera, you know. So uh, so, so I, I kind of enjoy that. Um, but it's important that like I don't become addicted to that. Uh, and and so, you know. I can remember like after like the first day I played on like poker after dark recently and like my phone was just fucking blowing up, you know, cause I just ran so hot that day. And so I was fucking around, you know, like, Oh, look at this, you know, like just texts from everyone out of the woodworks about just like what a legend they think I am and shit like that. Just like what, whatever, whatever over exaggerated comments. And I, I just quickly caught myself and I'm like, okay, well, that's what they think today. Tomorrow you could just like lose a million hands, whether you play bad or not. And then like now the world's against you. So I just think it's really, really important overall to not give a fuck and not live for that attention, affection, admiration. Um, and, and, and that's like my relationship with social media as well. Uh, I really try and like have like a very distant relationship with it and stay off it because like if I want to be checking it because like it, it, if I'm being very honest with myself makes me feel good when like a fan writes like you're the fucking goat you know if that actually like does something for me then i don't see any way that it's also not going to do something for me when like the next guy writes like a well-reasoned like approach to why actually i played this hand like garbage or why i'm actually probably kind of garbage or whatever it's i think you can't really have one without the other so i mostly just like try and distance myself from it entirely uh, and just know that like playing on streams is just like a necessary evil of uh, of getting to play in you know huge like high stakes games. Hmm. It's an interesting thought about the idea of if you care about the good things that people say, also you care about the bad things that people say, and if you let the good things impact you, then the bad things they say are going to impact you a lot too. Yeah, you know, as a as an avid avid NVG reader in two plus two for fifteen years straight. You know, you've seen so many scandals over the years, right? And the ones where the guy comes in and he's just responding to every individual troll. One guy who reminds me of that is uh, Hasib Karenshi, who I actually did a, a series with years before he had drama. You know who that is, at least, right? I had, him, I had him on the podcast before. Dog is head. Dog is head, correct. Yeah, so he, I remember he would like, there'd be just like a huge drama and then he would just respond to every troll's post. And I was just like, this is insanity. Like, what are you, like, what are you doing? Like this guy was, he was clearly brilliant. Although probably I, I, 
you know, certainly whatever, like a very scummy, scammy kind of guy. Uh, but it was like to, to be so deeply affected to respond to everyone. Like, I don't know, it's, it's just not going to work out well. And, and that's why I like, although kind of by force, I have to be some small figure in the poker world. Um, I, I, I try and avoid it because I don't really think it does anything good for my life. Maybe I could monetize it to some extent, but again, I don't care about that. So, so that's just like a non-factor. Yeah, I guess that's a question everyone asks themselves in poker, if they play poker, if they want to be known, or if they don't want to be known, if they care about that, if they want to take advantage of that, the good things that come with it are bad things. I mean, I think for a lot of people, it's gotten them to places where they get to play in these private games now with players who don't know how to play poker at for very high stakes. People have leveraged their image to to get into those. Shout out to a few people I'm thinking of off the top of my head who have done that very well. And I mean, yeah, that's something that certainly can come along with with having a personality or being known in poker is that you get to play in games that you might not otherwise get to play in that are very, very good games and maybe good people to interact with. And and yeah, there's that kind of aspect of things. Yeah, I think I can go both ways, to be honest. Like when you're, you know, if you're super well known as a crusher, you know, that can work against you too. So, so it really just depends, but I, I, that certainly can serve you, you know? So it's like, I don't know, like I went on this podcast cause you know, we're obviously good buddies. Like, you know, I would, this is the least I can do for you in terms of like a favor and you've done plenty of favors for me and like whatever too. But, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not necessarily like trying to do anything to, to have increased exposure. I can't, can't really see how that would be a net benefit for my life. So. Yeah, I don't. I haven't seen you do anything really in poker to try to increase your exposure. I mean, going on Survivor, you could argue increases in exposure, but what, what the hell were you thinking when you went on Survivor? I, I, oh, no, that's, no, that's totally. We haven't talked about that ever before. So what? What was the, like the desire? Because so Survivor reality show. If you guys don't know it, you got to at least watch it one season. It's pretty epic. But yeah, what was the it, like? Why did you want to go on that show? I don't. Yeah, what, what was like yeah. the. Well, so, I mean, th th all, this all happened like really quickly, but I'm basically just like at a bar with a bunch of my friends uh, one day and a couple casting directors come up to me and they're like, hey, this is a situation. It's already finals week. It's like day three of seven. Um, you know, many of the people who made it to finals like aren't what we're looking for. You know, so so we're, you know, we're out recruiting some people, you know, tell us a little about yourself. So I think I was first recruited because I had a look or whatever that they were looking for. So they told me later on. And then when I told them that I'm a professional poker player, I think that's when they're like, yes, you know, cause at that point, JRB had been on and he was like a great character for the show. Um, and maybe a couple other like smaller poker players at that time. This was before a couple of the more recent ones too. Um, and, and like, yeah. And the next thing I knew, like, they're like, all right, here's the deal. Like you have to go stay at this hotel for five days and then you just go through the process. And so I went home that night and thought about it. And I was like, this is pretty fucking cool. You know, like I always, again, like going back to what you're talking about, like trying to do something new, fun, trying to be alive, right? Like not just going through the same fucking motions of like doing your job 40 hours a week. And then like, I don't know, like taking two weeks in, on a fucking cruise or something stupid like that. Right. Like just doing something that's like, way out there uh and then i also thought about again like gratitude i go this is an incredible opportunity anyone is going to just jump up and down for this chance i mean you're, you're shaking your head no uh and sure there's, a, there's i think there's a small minority of people that would say no but most people it, it's just it, it's just such an incredible opportunity it reminds me again of doug when he hit me up like you know years later like asking me to do whatever i could for him to help him get on the show like i mean this is a guy who, who can just have and do anything he wants. Uh, but not that, <laughs> you know, like I obviously I've done everything I can for him with Lynn, shout out to Lynn, the casting director. Um, but it's like, it was just like an incredible opportunity. And although I didn't last very long on the show, although I don't think I played well on the show, I'll never forget it. It was the, the most fun, like I've, like I've ever had. I remember one of my favorite moments I'll never forget is like, we're on this helicopter, like right about, uh, and it's me and my team of six, three teams of six this season. So it's me and five other people in this helicopter. And we're just flying over this like deserted remote area of Northern Philippines. And I was just like, is this fucking real life right now? Am I really like in Philippines on this helicopter, like overlooking some of the most beautiful things ever? 
Then you land. There's fucking 200 cameras everywhere. You see the other two teams. You see Jeff Probst. And at that point, like, I'm the biggest fanboy in the world, right? Because I've been, like, studying survivor strategy for months straight, which obviously did no good for me whatsoever. Uh, but anyway, like, and, and it just, like, and then, like, that moment, like, I'll just never forget it. And I'm just, like, right now is a moment I'll never forget. And what I'm doing right now is really, really special. And no one can ever take that shit away from me, you know? And, and so would I do it again? Definitely not. You know, when you think about the EV of it versus like, you know, investing what amounts to seven weeks of your life, it's, it's not really worth it for me. But the novelty of doing it the first time, it, it's invaluable, you know? Uh, despite maybe uh, minute by minute out there, I wasn't always having the best time. So. Do you think we can get you on, on The Bachelor? I mean, I would, that, that's like another thing I would never, ever, ever do. What, what would be the benefit of that? Again, like I have no, that would be fun. I would go on, I would not go on the bachelor because I'm probably going to get married to, to a certain woman. But if I hypothetically before that, I might, I probably would have gone on the bachelor. Nice. It's this, I don't know, think I'd win. I got no chance. A minute ago, or what? what do you say? Young lady who just gave you a hug a minute ago. That's you getting married to or what? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Ooh. Okay. Okay. I don't know. All right. don't, tell, don't tell her that, even though she's in the chat right now. Don't tell her that, Garrett. It's pretty personal, pretty quick here. Huh? Don't tell, don't tell her that. <laughs> and I would love to see you on the fucking Bachelor. Oh my god, <laughs> amazing! I had, I had a pretty good college friend who was on the Bachelor. One of the one of the best looking dudes like ever. Like he pulled every single girl. Uh, and he he was on the Bachelor. It was pretty funny. He like his name was uh, Nate Bakke. I can't remember the season for for you Bachelor lovers. Maybe he finished like eighth or something. But anyway. I heard from him and others, The Bachelor is just like the biggest scam ever. Like that, it's just like, it's just staged to such a large extent and I don't know, it's just bullshit. There's a show called Unreal that mocks The Bachelor and I, I suspect the show's really not that far off from that. I didn't, I didn't know it was, it was fake. I didn't, I didn't know it was like that. Yeah. I thought it was a real show, man. Shout out to Taiwan uh, in the chat. Survivor, completely authentic in every single way, allegedly. We'll, we'll go with that move on kaka man says ask me if you ever played in molly's game have i ever played in molly's game no um but great fucking movie that's all i got on that you like the movie loved it love aaron sorkin love social network love everything he does love newsroom is uh his sort of very didactic dialogue in, in all of his movies and uh He's just got a very unique style that's like love it or hate it, but I just think he's he's an absolute genius. I don't know what that word means. What did you just say? Di didactic? Yeah. Well, like, How do I spell this? <laughs> D-I-D-A-T-I-C. D-I-D-A-T. Now you got me a little self-conscious. Like I'm not using it in the right context. I don't know. I've never heard the word before. I don't know. Didactic. Okay. Intended to teach particularly and having a... Moral instruction as an ulterior motive. I got to ask, but I don't know what a word means. Okay, nice. I nailed it. Good. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> well, there you go. I've never heard the word before. No. Use it next time you want to sound pretentious as fuck the way I just did. <laughs> I don't know. I try I try sometimes, but I try to use sometimes purposely use certain words, but then I, I just, I don't know, man. I go back to my upbringing, man. I wasn't using no words like that. God. <laughs> I was, we were talking, we were talking pretty much in slang growing up. So I still have a lot of those habits built up in me and, and the slang certainly comes. I'm sure people. I'm sure people see that when they watch me. Too. Well, and so that's the case with me to some extent too. But again, that kind of goes back to me just like coming to terms with the fact that I'm a fucking nerd, you know. And I used to really try and downplay, uh, like, you know, my intellectual capabilities by just trying to speak as dumb as possible and like whatever. And then like I don't know. There's like in my mid twenties, I go, why am I trying to do this? Like, just be me, you know, and me, someone that's, you know, an avid reader and. You know, uh, I like words. Might as well use some of the words that I've learned. Oh, I mean, it's nothing compared to, you know, to some guys. Showman, that's another guy. That's what a fucking vocabulary this guy has, huh? I think when you're in town, I might need to might need to get a little a little introduction together for for us. You, me, and Nick can get together, and uh, you guys can have a little conversation. I'm sure that'd be quite the interesting conversation to hear you two talk to each other about about poker and life. And there I am. I'm sure it would be. And those type of things. So I like giving six shout outs to a guy I've never met, but yeah. <laughs> All right, when are you coming to Vegas next? Are you planning to come here for EDC or anything like that? I will. I will be there for EDC. I will be there whenever I'm on poker after dark. I will be there for the main event. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Vegas. Uh, I've just 
I don't have a problem with it, but I've just worn it out in terms of just the amount of time I've spent partying there and all that. So I try to just kind of only go there for work now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, my next poker after dark appearance has yet to be finalized. So they are remodeling the studio or, um, creating a brand new studio and that should be done very soon here. And then, uh, then we'll go from there, but obviously, you know, getting to play that big is always fun. And, uh, Hopefully, I will be on um, quite a lot throughout the rest of 2018. So, people in the chat have been asking about certain people's games, what you think about them. What do you think about uh, playing with? I'll just mention a couple guys. Somebody like playing with a, a Matt Berkey, who you played a very large pot with on Poker After Dark. I think it was at the Aces versus Kings. You at Aces, right? Um, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, I was the guy with three aces versus three kings in like a five bet pot pre or four bet pot pre or something like that. Yeah, pretty uh, pretty standard for me to just cold deck the fuck out of someone. Um, but no, I don't really feel comfortable like talking about uh, anything like that. Um, and that it sounds like that's like a bad look to Berkey. Like I don't think he's a good player. Um, when I when when that's not the case, I think Berkey's a uh, very good player. I think. Uh, one thing I always try and work very, very hard at, which again has kind of uh, uh, has been lost upon me in the recent weeks when I've been playing bad, is I always try and like compartmentalize every little aspect of my opponent's game, and not even just like compartmentalize like what someone's range looks like when it goes bet check bet or something, but even like many of the non-technical aspects of someone's game. Um, and I think Berkey does many things really, really well. So I try and like learn from, or at the very least, like have a deep respect for at least some aspects of all of my opponent's games. But in terms of just like overall, like you could ask me about like 20 different people and every single one of them, I'm just going to be like great player, you know, and, uh, that that's going to be true. But it's also going to be true that I'm going to think each of those players has areas that, like, I can take advantage of. And, again, in terms of this, like, deep self-belief in myself, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think that, like, you know, yeah. That basically, that, that, that there's problems in basically everyone's game. Um, and so I feel like if you ask me about a bunch of people, I might be, like, disingenuous because I would just be, like, overly nice about everyone. So... What are you playing with uh, with double A? Anyone, Alex Riley? Uh, really, yeah, I guess that's someone I can uh, speak honestly about. No, I, I think he plays pretty well. Um, we haven't really logged that many hours, but I don't really have uh, I don't have anything negative to say about uh, his game. Although, if I did think something negative about his game, I would definitely say it. So he he plays good, fine, like not even close to close to enough hours for me to. To, to really say much beyond that. He's never tried angling you, right? Never been never been involved in any sort of ang angle, angle situation by him? Uh, no, not necessarily a straight angle. You know, uh, last weekend, um, I was ready to go home after losing a big flip. And me and Alec and the third guy, who I won't mention, I don't see there's a point, uh, are playing three-handed. And I go, you know, this game's too small for me. I just lost too much money. I'm just going to, like light more on fire i'm like you know but if we play two four i'll play and alex like you know sorry like you know can't no more money blah 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 uh and so i just we are like at a standstill for a while uh and i'm like andy you want to play two four up oh, use the other guy's name oh well <laughs> anyway another guy we're playing with he's like you want to play two four and he's like yeah yeah let's play two four and then Alec was magically able to find some chips. And then this is a direct quote. Oh, I didn't know I had these chips. And then reloads from 50 bigs to 100 bigs. So I usually try and avoid drama. Uh, and, and I probably should have here too. But I thought from, from a guy who uh, been accused of some not so cool things, I thought that was just like yet another one in the arsenal to, to somehow just uh, – have another twenty thousand in your bag that you just never knew you had. You know, pretty strong, pretty strong stuff. You ever had that happen to you, Garrett? Where 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 you forget you get you forget you have some some money on you when someone asks you if you have any more money on you? Has that ever I, happened to you? Not unless it's the next morning and I've had at least twenty four cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> unless Prahlad Friedman gives you a fucking cup of liquid weed. Yeah, yeah. So 
Yeah, I mean, it never happened to me. I, I don't know. I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't heard that before. Yeah, like I didn't know I had more money in my bag to reload here and, and add on more money. So, yeah, I mean, all right. Since I already threw myself under the bus here, uh, I'll just say one thing about Alf, and then we can just move on. To be clear, like uh, my interactions with him, like, have always been like pleasant enough. Uh, I've, you know, especially like after like you know his most recent drama, like just kind of prefer to just like shy away from him. But we played recently a few weeks in a row and. He's like incredibly nice to me, like makes a big effort, like doesn't certainly doesn't do anything like wrong, minus like just lying about like not having at least another 20,000 in his bag. Uh, but it's just like a gut feeling for me with him. And that's I'm always kind of like that with people. I just think there's a small subset of people where you just know, like you just know that like, I don't know, that, that everything they're doing like has some sort of like motivation behind it. Uh, and it's not necessarily like a, a kind one or, you know, like, I don't know. And so I just like, don't have like a good feeling like about this guy. And then shout out to Shark Tank, Mark Cuban, who like always goes fucking nuts on any company when he thinks like the product is bullshit or kind of scammy. Like what, I don't even know what he sells. Like that's how little I give a fuck, but I don't know. He was plugging his whatever bullshit that I don't even want to plug on your show. Like, uh, on live at the bike one day and i was just like he, he then he asks me if i have it or if i'm interested and i'm like no like i don't i don't buy snake oil you know like it's it's not really for me but i think just like anything that's like trying to take advantage of like the least intelligent segment of consumers uh like those people can go fuck themselves like figure out a better way to like make money in capitalism than sort of this lowest common denominator like hard money lending rent to own bullshit you know so yeah yeah hold on i'll let it, I'll go. Let it go it's not going, not going away people in the people chat, chat here. Here. by the way i shouldn't say hard money lending like i want i want to say like predatory lending obviously hard money lending like certainly like has its place in real estate and whatever, but like when it's done in a predatory way against like um, sort of the most vulnerable consumers, that's like when it's bullshit, just like the whole rent to own industry and, and a million other examples that we won't get into, but I just think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm very much in like the consumer protection slash corporations are evil camp, you know? But that's that's another topic. Shout out, shout out to the payday loan business out there that uh, charges a ridiculous amount of rates and they make it impossible for you to cancel if you want to cancel. And then also if you don't pay on a certain date, they might bump your interest rate up 20 percent and they take advantage of people that don't understand exactly what they signed or how exactly the payday loan works. And then they have them calling them up forever, trying to collect on the debt and trying to ruin their life. And I've definitely uh, I've, I've I've looked into this industry a lot, actually. Garrett. So I'm very familiar with kind of how the system works. I think I watched a really great, it was a thing, something on Netflix about it too, that talked more about how the business I works. Really just thinking that, was it the six episodes of yes. free money? Mm -hmm. Every one of those was fucking brilliant. Oh man. Well, that was one of my, I watched an endless sea of documentaries and this like six part hour long, each series, each on a different topic was, it was just awesome. What, what, what documentaries have you watched that you enjoyed besides kind of those, those short shows? Oh, I don't know. There's, I, I don't even know where to start. There's just so many, but uh, you know, a couple I always go back to that I'll just like never forget is I just love, uh, I just love animals. I have like two dogs. They're everything to me. Uh, there's this one movie called The Cove, and it's about dolphin hunting. Uh, that is single-handedly like the most powerful documentary I've ever seen. It's um, it's incredible. And then this one's not as good, but I still loved it. And this was Blackfish, and that's about uh the uh the whales at sea world so th those are a couple that immediately come to mind but i you know i have like a hundred others that that i could think of and i'm not at the moment so. i watched recently uh, a, a series about hugh hefner hugh hefner is a, a legend and that was very very i think it was very one-sided very much skewed towards hugh hefner's favor and the playboy empire's favor but i thought it was very informative it kind of told me a lot about him in the 60s and 50s that he did for the country and for uh, the black rights movements and those kind of things like that, that I had no idea. And just the way idea, the idea of how obsessed and how much he 
was 24 seven, seven days a week, his business playboy, his enterprise, wanting it to be perfect, taking it, wanting to be a part of every detail of, I mean, how they, it was all sort of really fascinating to me. And also, you know, eventually he just adopted a lifestyle where he dated seven women at one time. I found that kind of interesting too, you know, play, I, I mean, like, I mean, I don't know. I was like, okay, this is pretty fascinating kind of shit. So that was one of the, the, the favorite things I've watched recently. Uh, another one I watched recently, since you were asking about documentaries, was called uh, Wild, Wild Country. Mm, I want to watch that. I haven't seen that yet. What's that? What, what do you think about that one? Oh, man. It's about like this cult in uh, like the middle of nowhere, Oregon. I loved it. I thought it was really, really good. Um, and then to your other point, just about like Hefner and like his, his like strive for greatness. Uh, that's like one of my favorite things to read about, learn about, whatever, are individual people. Who just like to say Get the fuck out of my way and then just like have this like singular mission to crush in life. I just uh, I have like so much respect for people, um, you know, that do that. Uh, you know, a couple people that I've read biographies on uh, that come to mind about that is Oprah. Oprah is like such a hero of mine. Like she's, I mean, like who who comes from like you know like poor African American like a baby at a young age and then you just become Oprah. Like I mean, what a god she is. Uh, and then this one's way more typical uh, or trendy or whatever, and that's Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk, I believe, still is only biography that he's like a part of, uh, where he had no like oh, say over the editing, but actually like gave quotes throughout. Was uh, and I don't remember the title, but the author, I believe, his name was Ashley Vance, uh, and so he wrote an Elon Musk biography, and it's just so incredibly inspirational uh, in terms of just like what an absolute beast he is but also such a cautionary tale too, because like the book is also very open about how his personal life has been a fucking train wreck his whole life. And like, if you're going to be Elon Musk, like, yeah, your personal life's going to be a train wreck, you know? And I think it really says a lot about, you just can't have it all in life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to be that great uh, at, let's just call it business and, and, and oversimplify it, like your, your personal life is probably going to suffer or, and or you have a series of character attributes that allow you to achieve at a level that basically no one else ever could. That's also going to make you like impossible, like as a husband, you know. So I thought I thought all of that stuff is interesting, and I think there's like a lot that I took away from that in terms of like, well, what is it do I that I really want? You know, obviously, like if someone makes it to the top of the poker world, that ain't shit compared to you know many many other things. But even if let's say that was someone's goal, like you know do if that if that's true like do you do your personal relationships need to suffer as a result and if so is it worth it you know questions like that so so what do you think do they need to do they need to suffer as a result and do you think it's worth it well i mean i think so like i think if you know if you if you really wanted to be the best like i think you would just be you'd be working in one form or another 16 hours a day and so you know i, I think that's definitely the case and uh you know like i used to work really really hard at poker uh and so, you know, my college years were very fun. You know, I did frat life at University of Arizona and whatever. And I spent a lot of fucking time, like, you know, in my dorm and then later in my houses and whatever, you know, just, just doing the poker thing and, and had an incredible college experience socially, but also missed out on a lot too, you know? So I, I there's always trade-offs in life and uh, it's just kind of up to, to each individual person how to balance that out. But I think that's a big difference. And I think people can really use that as an excuse or a crutch, you know, like are, is the time that you're spent not working on your professional endeavors. If you're deeply focused on, on achievement at the highest level professionally, is that time actually spent on other worthwhile activities such as like making connections with people you're close with or, or you know, are you watching porn or, or reality mm -hmm. TV and, and, you know, just sitting in a room with your wife, not talking to her watching, some TV show for six hours, you know? And I think a lot, a lot, a lot of people are uh, kind of fall into that category. And I'm kind of glad that that's the case. If everyone was a high achiever, man, it would be hard as fuck, right? Mm -hmm. if the, if the top 10% was like the top 90%. It'd be a really fucking competitive world. So, uh, so I, you know, I'm thankful for that, actually. <laughs> I think that's um that's an interesting point. A lot of people say they don't want to obsess about something or or get with that sort of mindset, but then a lot of their free time from people I know and even from myself too is spent not necessarily doing those things you talk about neglecting or talking about not wanting to be better at. And I think for me, I, I think the idea of sacrificing 
many, many things around you, personal relationships for something like poker, I think definitely worth it. And it's something I'll always think about, but I feel like it's driving me fucking crazy thinking about it a lot. So I'm just like, you know, it is like you get to this point and you never get to this point by not sacrificing those personal relationships for that period of time. And, and as you mentioned, right, you got to sacrifice something. If you look at the people that are great or that are, that are elite at whatever it is, like a lot of those people have sacrificed things. And the people that have that haven't that, that cho- chose not to sacrifice things, maybe they wish they did so they could be more elite. So it's like no matter which way you look at it, there's always going to be something where you wish you would have done this or wish you would have done that. And and yeah, I mean, it's you can choose to embrace what you did or choose to embrace the path you're on or choose to wish you did another path. And yeah, I mean, I, I just think so much of this is like mindset work, you know, like I feel like the individual choices you make in life, are, uh, they're like a fraction as important as like. If you just like approach each day and each moment with like the right mindset, if you can do that, I don't know. I, I think that's just how you win, you know, again, by, by the way I kind of define winning and that's just, you know, waking up each day with a smile. So. Did you wake up today with a smile, Garrett? You woke up smiling today? Fuck yeah, man. Today was an incredibly exciting day, man. Cause I'm just so pumped about Coachella tomorrow. This morning's workout, man, it was like, I was just bouncing all over the place. I probably had those Adderall eyes everyone's accusing me of, man. Cause yeah, I mean, like I said, like I, I'm just so excited for Coachella tomorrow and it's going to be, you know, one of the, the best few days of the year. I'm like so deeply passionate about music. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's just Disneyland for, for adults, you know, or where, where, where are you going there with a uh, girlfriend and then a, a huge group of, uh, of our friends. So it, it'll be, so we, you know, we, do a, we do a lot of both. We do mostly with the group, but sometimes we'll separate, do our own thing. And I don't know. It's festival, man. If you haven't tried it, try it. Probably not sober for the first time, though. <laughs> it sounds like an uphill battle. <clears throat> yeah, I'm trying to think. When I found music festivals, I remember you mentioned earlier, you had like a feeling of fun that you didn't feel before. And that was certainly a feeling I had when I first tried. I was like, oh my gosh, it's quite amazing. <laughs> like, fuck, you know. Dude, you're like at main stage of EDC and then you just do like one 360 and you just see like 100,000 people just going nuts like at the same time, like in unison. And you're just like, what? Like, it's like sensory fucking overload. You're like, what is this shit? Like, or more, more like, what have I been doing with my entire life and not just this, <laughs> you know? Like, it's, uh, it's pretty funny because I was actually – um, you know, I'm not a young man anymore. I'm 31 years old and I actually didn't get into festival living until three or four years ago, which is for those of you who don't know above the average age, even like 27. Uh, so I'm like a super late bloomer, uh, to this sort of thing. Cause in the past I was always very against that kind of stuff. And it's just a perfect example. Like just try everything once, you know, give, give something a shot and you never know when you might just like absolutely fall in love with it. And that's kind of just like what I try with like, you know, a million other things. Uh, for every like few things that we've talked about today that are like passions of mine, I've tried a hundred other things where I go, eh, you know, not for me. But if you're just out there doing the same shit every day, like, I don't know, you, you're missing out. And also like, I don't, it just sounds exhausting. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But I deal, I deal with sort of, uh, like questioning like my existence and what the point of it is and things like that a lot more than than most people and i actually really really uh admire and am envious of people that just don't think about that kind of shit and then if they truly are just like they don't think about it and they're like at peace with it like i mean i feel like that person wins like more than anyone else you know it's just it's not me it's not my makeup and so it's like an unrealistic goal I share that envy of people that are like that. No doubt about it. It's amazing. Yeah, it's easy to like be elitist about it, right? Like it's easy to like, you could phrase it as like ignorance is bliss. Like, oh, they're just like that because they're stupid or I don't know. Like, I don't even think about it that way. And I like truly don't even care. Like, I, I really like, again, like I don't really care about being like smart or wealthy or none of these things are goals of mine. Like, I just want to live with peace. And if, if, you know, some guy has an IQ of 80 and makes 24 K a year and like, you know, lives in a trailer park in Iowa, like, uh, and is like happy with his wife and seven kids. Like that guy fucking crushes. Like that guy wins. He wins so much more than like almost any other person, you know, now admittedly, like, you know, a guy living in a trailer park in Iowa 
probably isn't all that happy, but if he is, <laughs> you know, he, he wins way more than, you know, the, the young multimillionaire ever does. In the chat, my buddy James Rosenthal said, can you ask Garrett if living in California with the sun and outdoors really contributes to his overall positive positivity and happiness? Asking from a Chicago tundra. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it does. It, uh, it really does for me. Um, it is trendy to either love or hate LA. And I unfortunately will continue the trend. I absolutely fucking love it here. I've lived here five and a half years now. Uh, and it's just, it's just been incredible. Uh, I just, I love everything about LA. I love how in my mind, it's like the social and cultural capital of the country. I'm sure many of you New Yorkers would probably disagree with me on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, and again, tomorrow going to Coachella is going to be like the perfect example. It's like it's like one of the biggest cultural like moments of the weekend, and you know, people fly all across the world to be there, and all I got to do is drive two hours. Like it's it's amazing, you know. But the weather, for sure, especially if you live near the beach, as I do, like the weather's like 10, 20 degrees cooler than inland. Um, you know, I love the weather, and to me, the biggest obstacles in beating LA are money and traffic. So if you have enough money to be able to live comfortably here and you can fade traffic either by making your own schedule, working from home, living near where you work or some other means, teleportation, uh, then, then, I mean, LA is awesome. So because, because I can do those things, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of LA. Just, although traffic is a big thing, it's a big deal. I have to plan my life around it. And there's many, many good games that I've missed because they, they start at 3 PM. I go, Nope. You know, we'll see what's going on at 8 PM, you know, and, and th that's okay. I'm at peace with that. So. Do you think we'll be able to go to the at some point in our life? life? No, I do not. <laughs> do you? No. <laughs> okay. Seems, seems like the favorite. Yeah. If not, I, I can see a wager. <laughs> My buddy Ryan Mark says Garrett must like to listen to progressive house. Yeah. Uh huh. For sure. Yeah. I'm a, uh, I'm not too much of a snob of one particular subgenre of electronic music, but definitely like a lot of progressive house. Eric Pritz is certainly a bit of a hero of mine, but I go through phases, you know, like the, I had a melodic dubstep phase where, you know, Elenium and seven lions and said the sky and others were just like heroes of mine, you know? And then, you know, I, I listen to a little trap music. Um, I, I listen to a little bit of all of it, you know, and, I generally don't love the people that are like trance for life, fuck dubstep or vice versa. You know, it's just, I don't know. It's just such, it's so elitist, you know, and I guess it's very common on the internet. Like I said, I, I studied music on the internet for fun. Uh, Cause I'm a loser like that. And so just like guys just sitting there getting in these fights about like one of them being better than the other based on the subgenre of electronic music they like is that's quite the head explosion for me. Well, I know my friend Ryan could talk about that to you for hours because he is in the music industry in LA. So he he uh, has experience. But he's kind of, I think he's retired right now, man. I don't know if he's ever going to make music again. Ryan, is he ever going to make music? He was recently in a, in a group and now he's not in the group anymore because he loves poker and he loves porn stars, I think. And, and by I think, I mean, he does. <laughs> Who doesn't? I love him too. And uh, I don't know if he's going to make music anymore, but hopefully he gets back into making music because he's watching this right now. And then you two can have a nice music conversation, Garrett, because, yeah, he, uh, what, I guess he was more, what was he, trap? I guess he was like trap, man. Ryan, what kind of music? It was, I think it was trap. I think that's what I would always consider it, but yeah, I consider it something else. So, for like your favorite trap people that you listen to? Um,. Good question. Uh, I like a lot of nightmare, a lot of slander. Um, let's see. How about we just go with uh, Coachella artists that I'm going to see. Alice in Wonderland I like. Troy Boy. These, these are artists who are going to be at Coachella this year. Um, yeah, those are a few. I'm sure the overwhelming majority of your audience doesn't even know what the fucking word trap means, so I won't I won't bombard them with 30 more artists if something they don't care about. <laughs> Yeah, trap music is. Uh, I I like trap music. It's very fun. It's one of my favorite things to listen to. I haven't been doing too many music stuff or festivals in this past couple of years. I, I started late too, and I was twenty seven, and I uh, had a very nice hard two year run or year and a half run, and then I, uh, you know, I don't know. These past few years, I've tried to been less out of line. Yeah, I always go. I get out of line. It just happens. And, I think that's the natural progression of it. I think the first year I festivaled, 
in terms of total days, I think it was like 30 or 40, which is just insane. That's just like a huge number for those of you who don't, it's not going to a bar, you know, like, so that's like 30 days or 30 fests, 30 days. Yeah. It might've been 40 days, but you know, either way, that's like, you know, if it's a two day festival, that means you're going just like, you know, one every three weeks or something, if I'm doing that math right. Um, so that's just like a lot, but now it's like, like this year it'll probably be 10, 12 days, you know, three for Coachella, three for UC right there. But anyway, you slow it down, but, uh, similar to poker, like a lot of people like quickly fade out of the scene. Uh, that's, that's not really the case for me. I still love it. And, uh, my girlfriend, like, which, uh, she's just like the best and is way too good to me. She, I think she won't even admit this, but I think she's kind of like phased out of specifically like the electronic only scene, you know? So she's like super pumped for Coachella and is like very, very multi-genre in terms of her tastes. Um, and I know she's pumped for EDC because it's such a spectacle. But I think some of the smaller ones in LA we go to, I think she goes, but I don't think she always is like, you know, she loves it, but she's just like there. We, I think last week it was, we saw uh, OK into Adventure Club into Marshmallow. So even these like pop as fuck electronic artists, like I love them too. Adventure Club's another one. How, how long have you been dating her for, Garrett? Um, it's been uh, a bit of an off and on thing, um, but uh, it's been many years. <laughs> uh, five years? Wow. Yeah. So, but uh, on five years, I can imagine the the can imagine the the the, the ups and downs, adventures. How, how do you think that's impacted your poker career, your poker playing, or your poker upswings or downswings? Uh, I think it's I think it's uh, it's been a net positive for sure. You know, the last. I don't know how long it's been year let's call it the last year has been just like really great um and uh and, and yeah so i mean it's you know it's i feel like i'm like every other area of my life have so much work to do consistently on being a better boyfriend and i feel like i'm slowly getting there um and so i think that's played a role because she's always been really great uh in our success over the last year but in terms of how or if she's helped with poker i mean she's been a net positive for sure like if things are really tough with her i just don't i just don't play poker because like i don't know i just don't i don't care i never really play poker if i'm not feeling it you know and then uh you know she's just an incredible support system when like things go really poorly uh and and just like always gives me advice you know in terms of opening new containers and letting it go and you know saying okay well you just lost x thousand dollars today what are you going to do tomorrow you're going to lie in bed and eat pizza or you yes. go in the morning, you know, like, and she, so she just really has always kind of kept me on track and just really helped me like mentally and emotionally with the swings of playing high stakes poker. Um, I think my job is really hard compared to most poker players, although probably still not as hard as someone who like travels around the world playing tournaments. That guy's fucking insane. Like I, you had David Peters on recently. Anytime, anytime you have like a guy who seems like a, a, a legitimate genius and that's what they do, it always blows my mind. I'm like, how could that be the way? That just sounds like the most in, like incredibly challenging thing for one to ever do mentally. Just travel around the world, bust, 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 like another 12 hour flight, bust, but like all just for like the time where you run good and bink. And I guess it's a little different with these high roller tournaments, but uh back when or if some of people like are still only just playing these mass field no limit tournaments it's that just that just sounds like quite a job but anyway going back to uh feeling sorry for myself here for a second like when you play like really big games they just don't happen very often right so you so you know this live at the bike thing has been great recently it's once a week that's somewhat consistent even that you know it's only once a week but in the past like you know i'd be playing games much bigger than that and you never knew when they'd go They'd go weekly for a while. They'd stop going. Like, it's it's the biggest fucking deal in the world. If you're playing, and I'm not exaggerating, a game that's 20 to 40x the next biggest game that you can play day to day, like, and you just lose, like, a thousand bigs in said game, how the fuck are you going to go play 20, 40, no limit? You know? Like, mm -hmm. the answer is, like, you just have to be, like, a mental giant. You just, like, you just do. Uh, and you have to just, like... 
be like, well, you're either going to work today or not. These are the choices. You know, it's just an incredibly hard thing to do. And it's something that I used to be just awful at. And, and again, something I, I work to try and be a little better at because it is just so incredibly challenging. And, you know, people say there's no long term in live poker. Well, that's true. But there is really no fucking long term in nosebleed live poker. Right, like if you're playing 40 hours a week at 30 hands an hour, or whatever. One, one, one of you guys can do the math on that. At least you're getting in some sort of reasonable sample size over a year period. Still not enough to, with any sort of degree of accuracy, predict your win rate. Well, now divide that by seven in the best case scenario, right? Or like you have 10, 20 total sessions, and that's just your entire year. Like there's no long term at all, and you just, you, you know, and you just got to do it. You just got to do it because that's like those are the best games and you know and it's it is it is fucking rough and so that's one thing i've worked on in recent years is to give myself a little credit for that like well i'm not a machine i'm not a fucking robot like i can't lose a thousand bigs playing one million two million and and then expect to to go play certainly not play well some smaller game you know and so that can be uh that can be really tough too but obviously I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, and I'm again, like deeply grateful that I have like the opportunity to do that. And, and I know every other poker player would trade places with me and they're all working their fucking asses off to try and play to try and trade places with me. So it's a question that a couple people asked me when I put the video up yesterday, someone said, is, is he could ever consider doing other things for income? And maybe taking a step step back from the game, as in, what did you say? Um, hold on, let me get this whole question. As what the heck is going on here? Hold on a second. If he's ever considered doing other things for income, and maybe taking a step back from the game, as in, if the high stakes starts taking its toll, unless he just has a massive bankroll or doesn't face him anymore. Yeah, I mean, the the swings like don't matter. I mean, this this one two game is honestly like like very small. Like it. You know, uh, I'm fortunate enough I could just keep running bad in this forever, uh, and it would just mostly piss me off because these other guys would just be winning my money, and so that's how that's how I stay focused on it. So it, it, the swings, as it relates to a fraction of my net worth or my life or things like that, that that means nothing. That doesn't matter. Um, but uh, the swings like affect me deeply emotionally, like. Uh, as we've talked about, hopefully not while I'm playing, but after a huge loss, it's it's hard. Like, let's give a, a hypothetical that's happened many, many times for me. Some of these live at the bike games are like not very good, you know. Like many of these 100, 200 games, like they're just there's not like it's it's a few like very good players and a few pretty good players, and you know like, um, but I've played in some games that are just like incredible, you know. Like uh, this most recent live, I guess I can just talk about this because it's public, like. This most recent poker after dark I played in, uh, it was like both days the lineup was just so fucking good, and so I absolutely crushed day one and day two. Uh, I ran kind of bad and played okay, not terrible, could have been better. Uh, and and I think I lost like two hundred or something, right? Uh, and it's just really hard because you're like, this was this individual day was such an incredible opportunity, and my expectation is so high that even to break even would hurt, but to lose a lot when like, who knows when the next game I'm going to play is that good. You know, it's, uh, it's just a tough thing, but I think, uh, one thing my girlfriend always says to me as a perfect example of like the support that I get from her is she goes like, she goes, Garrett, if this was easy, like everyone would do it. Like everyone would like, you know, uh, they would, be able to build up a role from nothing to, to what you have. They'd be able to handle all these swings. They'd be able to keep working on their game, practicing in smaller games, which by the way, many of like the smaller games I play in day to day, I mean, those are with some really good, tough players too. So you really do like quote unquote practice quite a bit during those games. Um, you know, like if everyone like could just like, you know, lose a thousand bigs in 1 million, 2 million and, you know, figure out like uh, how to keep it going, they would do it. But it's just really, really hard to do. And not only that, but not only do I do it, but I do it basically with reckless abandon, right? Like the way I'm playing, like 
you watch me play like small, huge, like whatever. If anything, when I'm playing huge, I'm even more of a psycho, right? Because I think people are playing on even more scared money, you know? And so I try and take a lot of pride in that. And when I come off a big loss, I try and say, how do I want to, how do I want to handle this? Again, do I want to lay in bed and eat pizza for a week? Or do I want to like, do I want to win this battle I have with myself? Do I want to wake up and go to the gym tomorrow and then come up with a new actionable plan about how I want to win the next day or win the next week or, or whatever the case. Um, and that's really hard to do. Uh, and like everything else we've talked about in no way am I claiming I'm good, great, or even good at these things. But, but that's kind of what I focus on. Um, I guess the other part of the question asked is have I ever spent time on other things, many, many other things, all like investment related, some with the market, some with real estate. Um, you know, I've passively involved uh, uh, with both. Um, but in terms of spending many hours on each over a long period of time, like outside of study, as in like a job, like let's say like, I'd become a professional fix and flipper or something. Um, I've just never found the passion in any of those things like I have with poker, not even close to where like, I just know myself, I know my financial situation that I'm not, I would just never be able to do it unless I really want it. So until I find the next thing I really want, I'm kind of cool just like always on, always on the quest, always on the pursuit. And, and you know, I'm just like, spend like many of my work days that are unrelated to poker these days, just like on the internet, just grinding a million different things, like just trying to figure out what's next <laughs> while also not trying to put this incredible pressure on myself to figure it out immediately that the journey is cool. If it takes years, that's cool, etc. cetera. So. We got a, we got Matt Burke in the chat. He says, I can attest to that running bad. And that lineup is misery. <laughs> <laughs> Man, every time I play with Berkey, dude, he just runs worse than the time before. It's pretty intense. It's so funny because so many people ask me about Berkey in particular, I guess, because uh, his game is so unique. And I guess because many things he does are not what Doug Polk would do, right? And so they go, what, what's what's the definitive answer? Is Berkey the best or the worst? You know, like, <laughs> it's only like one or the other. I get that question too, actually. <laughs> I'm so, it's like, Actually, that's not about you too, to be honest with you. But I mean, yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. No, and I, I actually think the the very fact that even like good poker players have no clue whether we're the best or the worst, I think in many ways is good slash a compliment, you know. But it, it is also funny when people compare me to Berkey because like I just feel like we do a couple things similar and like three million things differently, you know. So it's just like again. We just both play like outside the box, I guess, to oversimplify it uh, quite a ton. But yeah, anyway, I think I get asked that in particular because every time we're both in a game, he finds a way to run worse than the time before, you know? So people are just like, this guy's the worst of all time, right? I'm like, I don't know. Like, judge for yourself. Like, we're playing on a fucking stream. Like, you can see the whole cards. Like, you can decide for yourself, like, you know, like what he's doing. But I mean, I think that I'm always gonna be like an advocate for many of the plays he makes and the types of player he is and, and players that are similar because I think I'm often able to see the merit uh, in a wide range of plays, you know? Um, and then sometimes with some people, you know, some things are just like straight bad, but I think that that's always served me well. When I'm ever playing with like a player I respect and see them do something that's, like very unique. I always want to take the time to really like think that through, maybe even go home and study it quite a bit. And yeah, sometimes I go, ah, that was just horseshit. But many times I go, brilliant, or yeah, that's good in this spot or that spot or whatever. And I think, um, again, I think compartmentalizing each aspects, uh, each aspect of your opponent's game and just in general having this open-minded mindset on all of your opponents, I think is, is really important. I think people always think that I think everyone sucks. Um, but that's not really true. Like I actually, you know, like when I talk with, with, with poker friends that, you know, are, are only pretty good players, let's say, 
Like those are the kind of guys generally who are just like, this guy sucks. This place sucks. Like, you know, and I feel like, uh, the evolution of, of sort of a, a more enlightened poker player is to, to find the good in a lot of aspects of your opponent's games. Dare I say, I'm taking that in. Dare I say, G, I'm just taking that in. I'm taking yeah. that part in. It's, it's funny, man. Like, my, my little fucking monologues, like, go on so long each time that there's always this, like, pause after, you know? You're like... Taking it in. Well, there's, like, seven directions you no. got. I'm running the real-time solver over here. I'm like, okay, well, I can follow you're up with eight, eight things he said here. Oh, no, you're doing it fine. I'm just the one who just rambles on about everything fucking forever, you know? So... That's what you're on the podcast for, dude. You're on the podcast too. That's why you're on. That's why you're on the show. So you can go on and, and you could you could go on these different directions. That's why you're on the goddamn show, yeah. man. Yeah. Part of me is like, Garrett, just shut up. But then I'm like, well, then there's no podcast. <laughs> I guess yeah, it's okay. exactly that's the, the the point is to get you to get you to talk and open up and show yourself off a little bit, kind of express yourself, get people to get to know how you think, who you are, and sure. you know that's always been my goal on here. Uh, Matt, did I'll say? Uh, someone said. Berkey, how much do you hate Garrett? And then Matt said he's genuinely one of my favorite humans in poker. So there, so there I think uh, you know, obviously, so, Matt, well, as he well knows. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've been enjoying. I'm glad Matt's doing a lot more stuff in poker too because he is trying to get the get his brand out there, solve for why he's trying to do more content out there. They're they're creating a lot of cool stuff. They just did like a little heads up for charity Nolan Holdem thing that he tried to get me to play for run it up, and I said, I was like, man, I'm sure I, I don't know, man, like. On stream, me playing Nolan hold him. I'm like a fucking idiot. So I'm like, heads, I'm like, even heads up. I don't want to play a two card pot little hand and look like a complete fucking retard. So I, I guess, know. dude, that's why I was thinking real quick. Like, that's why I feel even kind of bad about like saying anything bad about Alec. Just because in general, like, I don't know. I just don't want to be like, I don't want to be negative really ever in life, especially like publicly. You know, he's he's already gotten enough shit. Like, I don't, I don't really feel the need or interest in perpetuating that further. And it's like. I get along with almost everyone in poker. Like I see the good in almost everyone. And I think that's another skill you acquire in live poker. Like you play with like all of these, like, you know, sometimes slimy guys, sometimes guys that have been around forever that aren't, you know, like they don't really have much to their personality outside of like grinding poker and like whatever, man, I can find the good in anyone. I can find the fun in anyone. Like mm -hmm. many of like the most notorious, like sleazeball scumbags, weirdos blah 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 like in live poker i like like almost all of them you know what i mean like Me I'm, too. <laughs> I'm, like not, I'm not talking about guys that like actively cheat by the way you know just like i don't know it's hard to even explain just like guys that like whine a lot or are bad at it there's just an endless sea of these characters in the los angeles poker scene and i'm like really good friends with all of them and like every time we see each other like we're both like really happy to see each other we we fuck with each other you know like I don't know. I just, I just have a good time with it. You know, like I feel like when I go play poker, like you just go down the fucking rabbit hole, you know? And really, I mean, that's when you know you're in a good game. If you're in a game with a bunch of fucking super smart young guys in successful relationships that clock in and clock out every day and fucking meditate every day and eat healthy every day. And you know, like, I mean, that sounds like the worst poker game ever. And by the way, like, Shout out to like one specific casino in LA who's like daytime poker game is like exactly like that. Like a bunch of guys who I really fucking like. And like, it's the, it's the toughest game ever because like these guys just like fucking have solved like the best way to play poker. They lose a big pot. They take a fucking lap for an orbit. Like, I mean, I'm sorry, man. I just don't have that shit in me. Like I'm not going to the casino and then like taking an orbit, AKA like 30 minutes off. Like that's just, this is not in my arsenal. You know, I'd rather fucking tilt it away than take an orbit every time I lose a big plot. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> well, I, I got a nice, I got a nice clip for uh, social media right there. That's, 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 that's true. If you're in a game where people are meditating and they're fucking on the iPads and they're talking about their wife and their healthy relationship and not, and drinking a coffee with, with a fucking cream and, and a, and a and a green tea with, with two lemons and all kinds of stuff. That's, that's probably a bad game. That's a good point. Dude, not only that, but these guys are so good. They're not even on the iPads. They're watching every hand. These guys are playing fucking the same stake poker every day, 40 hours a week, and they're fucking watching every hand. 
what is wrong with these psychos? Like, this is insane. There's one guy who's been doing it. He's a great player. I mean, since I think he's been doing it for like 10 years, like every time, same day, five days a week. Uh, there were some bigger games at, at this casino for, for a while, right? And the, the game was playing eventually as big as 200, 400, right? Uh, every time that game would, like, they play that day, uh, and then they'd leave, and then they'd come the next day knowing there'd be no game, and they'd play 20, 40. Every single day. Like, these are the guys to be afraid of. Like, it's like they have no fucking – so how do you do that? I, I have no idea. I have no idea how they do that, but uh, – I don't know. But anyway, if you're in a game with a bunch of people like that, that's when you should be scared. I have one quick story. So one of these guys who I'm referring to as like these guys who just win at life, he's having a conversation with like a more like degen type guy. This other guy I don't fucking like. He's like, he's lame. He's like one of these guys who like sits and talks about how he's the best and he's very abrasive and whatever. Right. Uh, and so he comes and sits at our table one day. Right. And just, just assume this table is like me and like seven other guys who like do, you know, the, the, all the, all the right things to win at poker. Right. Okay. This guy sits down and like, whatever. And he just starts talking to me and he's like, Garrett, like, how's it going? Like, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, I've just won a fuck ton of money lately. Like I just bought a new car and starts like bragging about his new car and like whatever. And I'm just like, not really listening and whatever. And then he says to me too, he goes, yeah, dude, what about girls? How's that been going? You know, and I'm like, well, you know, been in a long-term relationship a long time. It's good. We're just chilling. And he just goes, yeah, man, I have been smashing so much pussy lately. <laughs> and I just, I just thought that was so hilarious. And then the other guy, the guy who wins at life chimes in, he goes, fuck, man, you're over here smashing pussy every night and I'm stressed about my IRA. Maybe I'm doing it all wrong. And, I, and that's just like one of my favorite moments in live poker that just shows like the dichotomy between sort of, sort of certain types of personalities and how they all just come together in this really, this might sound corny, but in this really beautiful way, you know, because we're all playing the same game and, uh, you know, uh, and everyone kind of just approaches poker and life and everything like that differently. So anyway, shout out to you. Guys worrying about your IRA and shout out to the rest of you who are only concerned with smashing pussy. I would ask him for the receipts. I'm like, I gotta see some receipts, bro. Show oh, me the yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. A guy like that, obviously, he's never gonna have receipts. And by the way, I really don't like that word. I'm only uh only using it to quote to quote this legend himself. So yeah. <clears throat> I wanna see the receipts, man. I know everybody people in the chat say everyone knows that dude. I agree. I think everybody does know that dude for yeah. sure. I might have been that dude when I was younger a little bit. I don't really know. I think maybe when I was younger. So, like, you have to understand, like, the time and place, which is what made it so extreme. I feel like when I just told that story, like, it didn't really have, like, the same punch as it, like, often does when it's, like, told over and over and over again at, at that particular casino. Because, like, it was just, like, eight guys, just, again, like, just, uh, we'll just call them adults, you know? Like, eight adults. And we're just sitting there quietly. And he just starts rambling on about all these things he's great at. And then just, just to just be like, yeah, man, I've been smashing so much pussy lately. It was, it was just it was amazing. I love this guy. I want to, I want to get him on the podcast, man. This, guy's, this, guy's, this guy? guy's the worst. He's one of my least favorite play people in poker. <laughs> Which probably shouldn't surprise you. Jarvis says, now I know Garrett is talking about the gardens. Uh, I'm not, but anyway, keep going. <laughs> Uh, shout out to the garden. Someone said I was taking a drink of this and I sniffed it beforehand to make sure it wasn't piss, and that's actually true. I did. So my <laughs> normal thing, guys, when I use the pee bottles, is I always because I I've actually drank the wrong one a few times. Is I go no, smell first and then and then you drink it. So yeah, you ever used up? You ever used pee bottles, Garrett? Uh I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> I got you know I I got I got girlfriend and some other people that might watch. I don't know if I want to confess to something like that. But uh, I just tell them I'm not lying. I'm not trying to lie about the pee bottles. Like, listen, this is what it is. But let's look at it this way: If you're playing high stakes, heads up, no limit poker for hours a day, every day for years, did you ever use the pee bottle? Probably. Uh, probably the answer is affirmative. But but I don't want to confirm or deny. Amen. Alex O'Down, Joey's girl is a saint for putting up with the piss bottle. <laughs> yeah, that shit's gross. If you don't immediately throw it away after, like. I don't know, man. <laughs> what are you leaving? It reminds me of my freshman year roommate, dude, but like 10 times worse. You know, you live in these small ass quarters 
uh, and he used to chew, and he would just leave chew cups all over the room. There'd be like 50 chew cups at any given moment. The room would reek of tobacco, and it was, I mean, it was a good experience to, to deal with, with, with this shit. But, I mean, he was like really fat and just like would just lie around, dirtiest dude ever. Shout out to freshman year of college, man. Best time of your life, worst time of your life. <clears throat> Sounds like it was fun. Let's get some questions from the chat in here. And um, I'm, I'm, I've seen a couple things in here. I've seen a lot of different comments in here. Pea bottles are nasty. I, don't, I disagree. Joe Ingram, a.k.a. Ray from Trailer Park Boys. Don't know who that is, but I'm going to agree with you. He's gotten a lot better now. Sasha says that is true. I definitely have gotten a lot better because I'm not playing as much poker online. Therefore, I don't use the, need to use the pea bottle. It turns out there's correlation between that. If you're playing, I mean, come on, Garrett, you're playing a lot of games online at once. And I can understand this, this argument of actually throwing the bottle out afterwards, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, where, where was a couple other, uh, Sam Canales said coming off a two day downswing today for negative 2200 sucks, but found some insight in his adversity. Appreciate that. Uh, weak trader. How much does he bench? I, I don't I don't do questions like that. <laughs> How much you bench, kid? That's what I'm saying. We already talked about this. Like I don't I don't like answers that are gonna divide me from what's the most amount of money or oh, sorry, what's the most you've ever bench pressed in your entire life? All right, I can answer that one because that's because that's not me now. Okay. Yeah, so that's three fifteen. The most I've ever benched is three thirty five. You win. You win. Fuck no, you. I'm done with this podcast. You no, see, I don't. Point, man. Now I hate you because you're stronger than me. Or at one point, which you, you, know, you benched more than me. I was also. I, I was on the. I was on P. I was on PEDs, Garrett. Doesn't matter. You win though. You know. And so now we're divided. We're never going to be friends again. Oh no, think- no, no, not really. <laughs> I think. I think all people that look at things like that. I never look at anything like that personally, so I, I can't really relate to that sort of feeling about things. Like, I guess that's the thing, like, I'm, uh, and I guess I'm not really closeted about it. Like, I wanted to say, like, I was a closet Phil and gay joke here. Um, but I was like a closet competitor, right? And I guess I've been open about it, like, in this, uh, in this podcast, right? But, like, I don't really like being, like, openly competitive, you know? Like, I'm going to beat you, or I bench this, or the, I don't know. I don't like doing those. Like, I just, like, privately, like... <laughs> You know, th- does that make sense? Like, I don't know. I just don't like questions like how much bench or how much money do you have or really anything that allows like two people to compare each other. Like, I don't know. I think I'm just really corny like that. You know, mm. I'd rather talk about how, how we can all just get along. That's something Alec would say, man. That's a double, that's a double A, right? That's a double A metaphor yeah. motto. So, so I hear you, but like, I mean, I just really mean that. And like anything I've ever heard out of his mouth, it just sounds like it's like bullshit. Hundred percent agree with you on that one for sure. I can oh, hear me disagree with you on that. Then yeah, then it's going to be the same sort of thing. <laughs> what did he say? Uh, Vinny Vinny says, "LOL, G men saying three thirty five owns three fifty. Is that his key to poker dominance? A questionable grasp on simple mathematics." <laughs> Wait, what did you say? The answer was for you. I said three fifteen. Oh, I thought you said three fifty. No, three fifteen. Oh, I thought you said three fifty. That's why. That's why you said three thirty-five, right? Yeah, because I, I thought you said three fifty. Yeah, I was like, you win. Yeah. Man, that was like my poker at one point in time in my life when I was when I was eighteen. I started working out when I was nineteen. I used to be like really like tall, skinny guy, and then I started going to the gym, and I was like, oh damn, this is kind of fun. And then you start body starts changing. All of a sudden, the women start showing you more attention. They're like, damn, big pop, you know, what's up, big poppy? You know, put them all. They're trying to. Okay, cool. And then you, and then I just got obsessed with it. I started working out every day. I bench press seven days a week. Turns out maybe not GTO. And my my whole entire goal in life was to bench press three fifteen at one point in time. And then I made a shirt that said Juice Man three fifteen on the back. Said three fifteen on the back. And I used to wear it around. People thought I was insane. I'd like wear like half shirts to the gym and be like, oh, we're going, like we, me and my friends were like walking around like pretending like we're poking a needle in each other's ass like with the stuff. <laughs> Dude, like it's like he was out of line. <laughs> like so many dumb things like that too. Like I don't know. It's it's all fun, man. You just learn from it. Like I don't know. Whatever. I'm. I also used to wear just like obnoxiously aggressive shirts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never. My fraternity made this one T-shirt, and it was a T. And obviously, I would just like. You, you. It was called like a like a deep cut, right? Where you just cut it like all the way down the sides. Like we're basically 
like your shirt was only held together by like one little thread on the sides. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're basically just shirtless, you know, but like you could get in the gym this way. And uh, and then right here, there was a bow. Uh, and then like right here, it said like two women from God. And then it like had my, my fraternity letters on it. Like, this is the kind of shit like I used to wear to the gym, you know, like, and I look back now and I'm just like, oh my God, is this, is this shit real? But also it was funny as fuck, you know, like people would like, you'd walk by and dudes would laugh and I don't know. It's funny. You can't take people have, the, people have their shirt. Where's your shirt at? I don't know. I, I'd probably... I'm sure every once in a while my girlfriend goes through my closet and just cleans out a bunch of old shit. I wish I had it. I'm, I'm sure it's gone by now. Vinny says, I remember that shirt. That shirt sounds epic as fuck. I actually do still have a shirt very similar to that, but this whole saying that you said is next level right there. I don't know. That is some next level GTO strat, so shirt funny. strat right there. The fucking bow. The bow is the best part of it. I loved it. <laughs> I wore it like three days a week, like smelly and everything. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. Uh, Kevin says, does he eat clean every day? Um, yeah, this one I get endlessly. So the answer is yes, every day or zero days. So that's, that's just kind of how I always do everything. Like I'm either like crushing it or, or not, you know? And so that's kind of like what I work on in recent years is instead of like trying to be 10 out of 10 all the time and then failing miserably. And then my average score on whatever I'm doing, like as a rating is like five, just trying to consistently be at an eight. So in recent years, it's more been like a nine out of 10 most days. And then like a day or two of five out of 10. So I'm, I'm working on it. I'm getting there. But uh, for those, for those of you who know me well, I mean, I've had some pretty intense weight fluctuations. Over the course of the last uh, 15 years, my weight has fluctuated 20 or 30 pounds like many different times. You know? Damn. Yeah. Definitely not healthy. What are you weighing right now? Not recommended. Uh, 190. 190. Dude, you look fucking way better than 190. Oh, thanks, buddy. You look, you look man, you look way better than 190. I thought you were like two, like two something right now. Try to keep it lean, you know? Dang. Are you going to try to put on more weight for, for summer coming up here? Are you trying to cut down still no yeah i'm always trying to cut man i've always thought that like uh being leaner is like a better look you know mm -hmm. and i think i'm naturally uh, i think i'm saying this right an endomorph meaning it's easier for me to gain muscle but really hard for me to stay super lean um so for that reason like basically i'm always just like trying to eat clean always trying to do as much cardio as i can etc like you know i've been lifting weights for so long i'm not really trying to get any bigger anymore the, the focus, I, even though I, I still lift, you know, five, six days a week, uh, the focus is always to try and get or stay lean. Mm. Andrew L O and about Garrett saying it's good to come off. It's not good at poker. Oh, that's way too much ignition strat, Andrew. I can't actually even say that because that's something that I, I uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into that one. Uh, let me go back up here. Bum, 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 bum. Did <laughs> never mind. I'm not gonna ask that one either. Not gonna ask that one either. MMKI, did you play any sports growing up for an extended period, Garrett? I developed all my discipline and work ethic from sports. How did you develop it? Yeah, I played tennis and basketball throughout high school. When I was younger, I played those two in addition to baseball and soccer. Um, discipline. Um, Okay, this is only going to kind of answer the question, but uh, this will probably come as a shock to most of you, but I am Jewish. My last name is Adelstein, and uh, as is admittedly somewhat typical in the Jewish community, I was raised as money being very important. So I was raised very upper middle class, um, and I was raised with my parents endlessly talking about money uh, all, in almost all situations how we don't have enough. Um, and I don't know, that just like, like rubbed me like some kind of way. And I, uh, just like from a very young age was insanely focused on never having to have any of these bullshit conversations and like never having to live in middle class or upper middle class is what I should say. Now, now I know that that's a, that's a great place to be. And the difference between upper middle class and upper, upper, upper is basically next to nothing. But from a very young age, almost everything I did was to 
set myself up as best I could to make as much money as possible. Um, because like for, for that and some other reasons, like I deeply believe that was going to be like the way to be happiest. Um, mm. and so, you know, like I was valedictorian in my high school and, uh, you know, good standardized test scores, all these things. And, uh, and I worked really hard for all of them. Um, because like, I deeply believed, uh, like all of that would again, eventually lead to like financial success later on. Then I found poker, uh, and, and it was kind of the same thing. Like at that age, like I loved, I loved poker for the mental stimulation. I loved it for the gamble. I'm a gambling addict for sure. No debate about it. And I loved it for the money. So you put it all together. And, and of course it was an obsession, like, like, like no other for me for, for whatever. So my discipline kind of comes from that when it comes to financial matters and it's all and, and i think my discipline otherwise came first like on an innate level from competition i just had to win everything so i think i became obsessed with fitness for instance because like i had to win the battle of pulling girls right so when you're 18 years old 19 years old and you're single and you're in a frat life like i was like i'm just gonna win i'm gonna do everything i can to just just destroy all of these guys at, at, at this particular skill. And obviously being in great shape uh, is a part of that. Now, as like it went, it morphed from that into just like uh, an obsession and whatever, th that's kind of how you stick with fitness because these material or superficial reasons to stay in the gym will never last. You have to find like more, like deeper reasons to stay in the gym for, for, you know, forever. And thankfully I've been able to do that. And obviously like, I really care very little if like women like find me attractive now, although it's nice. Like when you're in a long relationship, it just doesn't really matter. Um, but for me, it matters so much. Like every day I finish my workouts, like the best moment of my day. And I just like, I'm like, I've already won today. I just feel so good about myself when like many days in my life, I'm not really sure what to do by just winning the workout. I already feel like, like I've won and I, I don't know. I just could go on and on and on about fitness. Like one of my favorite books is the encyclopedia of modern bodybuilding by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the first chapter of it has nothing to do with technical aspects of weightlifting. It's all just about why he lifts weights and all the amazing things it does for his life. I seriously recommend anyone, even if you don't lift weights and you're just like considering exercising more, just read that chapter. Like the, it just like, you can just, it like jumps off the page at how fitness has saved his life and it just does everything for his life. And I've, I've felt that just forever about it. So, yeah. Sounds like a book worth checking out. What was the name of it? By it's, Arnold it's very, very famous. It's called the encyclopedia of modern build bodybuilding. It's old now. It was like Arnold Schwarzenegger wrote it. Like when he was like a bodybuilding champion. So. I think it's a great way to look at working out and it kind of looking at it as, you know, people say like, make your bed when you make your bed, you, you get something done for the day and it starts your day off as a win. And you can kind of take that momentum throughout the day. And I guess you have working out like that. We're working out when you work out, that's you winning the day. That's you achieving something great for the day. And then no matter what happens after that, you're still going to feel great about what you've achieved. Yeah. I do that too. The, the make your bed thing every day. Like there's a bunch of little things I do like uh, for that obviously like you, me and everyone and their mother seen that general or whoever give that speech mm -hmm. uh, about it's it's one of the sickest speeches of all time um so yeah i completely agree with that i make my bed every day i have what i refer to as a morning ritual which again shout out to chris sparks i've helped to perfect that um that basically uh and, and i'll just tell you the whole thing because maybe it'll be of, of service to people it starts with waking up making my bed feeding my dogs eating a perfectly clean breakfast meditating for somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, depending on how I'm feeling that day, then taking my jaw dogs on a 15 minute run and then going to the gym for two hours. Right? Like if I do all of those things each morning, I just feel like such a fucking champion. And all of those things like are so deeply important to my life. I think, although I don't know and don't really care, I think greatly affect my ability to play poker in a positive way. Uh, it's just incredibly important and it's incredibly important to me to do it in the morning. And until I do that, like I'm not myself. And whenever I'm having a shitty day, the first, second, third question I ask myself is, have I meditated today yet? Have I worked out yet today? And almost always the answer is no. And like, that's why, you know, like, 
Hmm. Uh, I'm not hating on like antidepressants and stuff. I've never even taken them. Uh, I'm sure they have their purpose for some people, but like for me, like that's always been the best antidepressant, you know, like in the world for me. And, uh, you know, unfortunately on the flip side is when I'm not doing that, you know, that that's when I struggle with things. And so I've always been interested in like people that just can wake up and then they can just be, they can just be crushers in some ways, but like not, not others. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm always interested, like, I don't know. I guess it's not that surprising, but specifically I'm always interested in very fat people who are incredibly good at business. Mm. That always kind of interests me. Cause like these things have always gone hand in hand. Like with, like if you're someone who's like incredibly good at business and you just didn't run hot, like I don't see how you don't just have this incredible work ethic. And I don't see how everyone doesn't have an interest in looking at least like decent, you know? And, and that would be associated with like, you know, food and nutrition choices. Have you ever talked with people who were that type of, I guess, you know, a guy who might be out of shape, but, but great at business. Have you ever met someone and had a conversation with them about it? Yeah, kind of, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of handle that situation with kid gloves. You don't want to just be like, why are you such a piece of shit when it comes to that? You know, but I think different ways to phrase it for sure. (laughs) Yeah. I think the general thing I've gotten is just like, they, uh, you know, I think I kind of know the answer based on some of these conversations and, and just thinking about it a little more. But, you know, like I've read a lot of books re- regarding uh, willpower. One of them, shout out to this book for those of you looking for book recs. It's called The Willpower Instinct, one of my favorite books. Uh, and it talks about like we only have a certain amount of willpower. And for one, like we have most of it in the morning, which is why I always complete my morning ritual in the morning. Right. Um, but uh, another aspect, again, is like th- we only have so much. So maybe some people just dedicate like so much of that to to business or whatever that they don't have it for fitness or it's just for me, it's never really worked that way. Like I'm always either just doing everything right in a given day or sequence of days or everything wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's not really a problem for me to wake up, work out two hours and then play like a 48 hour poker session. Like if, if it, if it calls for that, if it's some huge game, you know, I don't, I don't know. And I don't, I don't really care. And like, if that session goes well, like I don't wake up, just drain the next day. I'm even more pumped to like get back in the gym, you know, like I'm a, like, I'm a, a, addicted to like little wins in my life. Uh, that's like, uh, like forward progress, positive momentum. I don't know. That's like, that, that just always really works well for me. I just have always just either been on good streaks and bad streaks. So, so much of what I work on in, uh, with my psychologist and and again when i worked with chris was continuing to have little wins you know and little wins can be the smallest thing you can be lying in bed feeling like shit. just get up and take your dogs on a 10 minute walk take a shower listen to music if you enjoy listening to music right he refers to them as fire breaks when everything's going to shit, what can you do to put out the fire and Maybe a two hour workout isn't in the cards, you know, when you've just been lying in bed and you just ate another whole pizza, but you could take a shower. You could take your dog on a walk, right? These are things you can do. And it's amazing for me how once I get out and take the dog on a walk, like next thing I know, I look back and I've just been crushing it in the gym for a month straight. You know, I've been putting in the hours of poker, et cetera. Definitely great stuff out there. Definitely great stuff. A fire fire break. Break. Yeah, I hope I'm sourcing like all these things I said. Like, I'm not smart enough to come up with any of this shit on my own. Everything I know, it's from learning from people smarter than me. You know. Mm-hmm. Someone said you were saying that while this bed in the background was unmade. Technically, this isn't my main bedroom here, and I, it happens to be a bed in here because that's actually fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, they said the bed. Um, I'm like, and you're right. Listen, man, Sasha, Sasha said that. Sasha said, my poppy's bed's been through a typhoon. I completely agree with you. And um, there are some days, there are some days when I have a pretty good morning routine, but. What do you mean by typhoon? Is there some innuendo associated with that? What do you mean? Like, what happened? 
a wild animal. I think I think I think it, I think it is. I don't I don't know if I want to say I, there is an innuendo. I, I believe there is an innuendo behind behind her phrasing the sentence that quite that way. Yes. Goat ran on your bed or, or what you're I think she's insinuating that that her nickname is the Taiwanese typhoon, aka T T, and she's alleging that Poppy's bed's been through the typhoon. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know what exactly. I don't know. You know, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm like two levels ahead of things, but I think that's what she's trying to say. So so yeah. People in the chat. I feel like people, um, you know, people like like this kind of information. They like this kind of knowledge. But so many people out there are kind of master fucking degenerates. And while they aspire to to live an inline life and to live a life where they're pursuing greatness, they're also fucking degenerates. So, do you have a degenerate story for them, Garrett, to make them feel better about themselves after they've been listening to this stuff and they say, "Man, I ain't gonna be able to do that with myself." Oh, I have, I have thirty million degenerate stories. Um. But, uh, but yeah, no, but in response to that, like, I will say that, like, I actually think part of living like a meaningful life is being a degenerate sometimes. So I think people should like cherish that. And as we talked about, like releases are important, you know? So I'm trying to think of a couple I've had. Um, this one is pretty good and I think it's okay to talk about publicly. Sure. Let's go with this one first. So, um, all right, so I think it was three years ago. Um, I fly to Vegas like a week before the main event, right? Uh, and I'd been on like a bad streak before. I wasn't really playing much poker, wasn't really exercising much, whatever. Uh, my girlfriend comes with me for the first couple of days uh, and we just hang out in Vegas. She wants to hang out there. We go to a couple of shows, like whatever. Um, then I take her to the airport and like she's giving me like a pep talk uh, because this is what I want. Like I wanted so desperately to stay sober and put in the hours playing poker. There were some pretty good, pretty big games. I think one, two was running pretty regularly, if not bigger, um, for that week, uh, before I played in the main event and I wasn't getting in the hours before she's like, you know, like you'll be fine. You can do this, like whatever, have fun, drop her off at the airport. I go sit. And at this time, the biggest game is a 5,100 game. And it's like me and the eight best internet players in the world. It's just a fucking miserable game. And uh, and I'm just like quickly tilted, quickly losing, quickly playing poorly. Uh, and maybe I'm down, I don't know, 20, 30, 40,000. It doesn't really matter that much. Um, and, uh, and then I find, and I guess I won't say his name out of whatever. Uh, but anyway, he's a bit of a flipping legend in Vegas. Uh, and he's down to start flipping me. So we start at like 5K a hand or like whatever, right? Um, and then we're building up. I quickly am down. I, I, I guess I'll just go ahead and use the numbers here. I'm quickly down. Uh, I believe it was 250 flipping, right? Um, and, uh, and I'm out of chips and I got to go to my box at Bellagio and, and go get a bunch more chips and, you know, and, uh, and I got a couple good friends there who like, also like, we're like, yeah, you'll be fine. You'll just play poker this trip. You'll be good. Like no degeneracy. Uh, and at this point, I'm obviously just getting like hammered drunk too. I'm not going to go through this pain sober, right? So I'm like hammered drunk down 250. And then I just go on this epic, epic run uh, where I go from down 250. We're flipping like, I'll just say we're flipping 20 a hand and we're like three tabling. So there's like three different tables next to each other. And I just go on the most insane run. Uh, and I just remember we quit when I won the last 12 in a row. I I'd rather not say the exact number I won, right? Uh, and, uh, and I'm just like blacked out drunk had just like won like some insane amount of money flipping. Uh, then a seat opens up in what is now the main game, which is a pretty good 5,100 and then just proceed to run absolutely insane in this game. Uh, in addition to all I won flipping, I won 200 in this like 5,100 game in like four hours or something. It was, it was just completely insane. Okay. Then the game breaks at 10 AM. Then we start getting really, really drunk. Uh, I go to like a house party that one of my poker friends is hosting. And a few of us are like, hey, like, have you ever been to EDC? And I had not, right? Uh, and I'm like, no. And I'm like hammered drunk. So I'm like, let's just fucking do this. Like, I'm in. Like, this sounds so fun. You know, like at this point, I'd started listening to electronic music a little bit. Uh, so keep drinking aggressively and then just like buy tickets online, go to EDC for the first time, uh, have like one of the best single nights of my entire life experiencing EDC for the first time. 
Uh, and at this point, like I had been up for like two and a half days straight. And like, I looked back at like the previous, like 30 hours before that or something. And it was like me dropping my girlfriend at the airport and just being like, all right, I'm going to fucking grind the 51 and one, two and be sober for a week. And next thing I know I was up for days and like had a couple of the best days of my life. So if anyone tells you that nothing good can come from flipping, I have a story for you right there. Uh, and my recent stretch of flipping, which has been beyond disastrous, I can always at least think of that day and uh, convince myself that it's not as self-destructive as I think. So there's one. Dare I say? GTO. GTO. Yeah, it does sound like you had a little performance, enhance performance enhancements to help you stay up these two days here, kid. I, I don't know, man. I'm not sure what kind of... Hey, man, maybe I'm just high on life, you know? Maybe I just... Well, there's some performance enhancing activity taking place in, in, in this... Some TOS may have been uh, may have been skirted on the line there for sure. But people, yeah, that's, that's pretty what I moment. faced in my life. Even though it was like over the course of sixty hours or something, I'm just going to call it one day, and that was that was such an incredibly fun day. And so, for those of you being like, "I'm so degen," like, how do I stop? I would say, well, if you stop, you will never have a fucking story like that. Uh, so maybe reconsider. Every once in a while, you got to get completely out of line, I think. Amen to that. That's very true. You will not have a story like that. That is very true. We're going to take one more question from the chat, and we're going to wrap it up for because we're, we are hitting over three hours, and I also do need to go to the facility rather bad, and I cannot use the the, the, the shit bag here on stream. I can only use that when I'm when I'm in the, in the deep depth of a session, and by that, I mean I actually don't have that, but somebody on my podcast alleged to use that once, and I still don't believe them. Even uh, even pissing on a stream would be a pretty strong play. You ever done that? Yes. Uh, <laughs> like, anyone find it? Anyone can find it out there. Like one to three times, or like twenty plus times. Like five. Nice. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Why? Well, I, I I hope you showed me the respect. Of, of, <laughs> if you did, no, it was they were never. <laughs> trying, they were, it, I would never thought about trying it with a guest, but it was it was during like a solo sort of stream like that. Oh, that's not as cool. I thought you meant with a guest. With a guest, it'd be okay. Really oh, yeah, okay. The guest would be really strong. I haven't done it today. No, no. I hate to disappoint you. I think secretly you would be like, ah, you got me. Okay, I didn't catch you, but yeah. Oh, I, think, I no. I mean, I there's quite a bit of things that go over my head. You you can find this ten times and during during this little podcast session, I wouldn't notice. I, I mean, I'm also a professional, so I could I could piss and no one would know. I am. <laughs> Got a lot of experiences for sure. So yeah, I love that move where like uh, you're in the shower, right? And your girlfriend's like uh, next to you getting ready, not next to you, but like, you know, in the bathroom and you like, you got to piss in the shower, you know, like you, you can't hold it. And so you're just trying to like play it off. Like it's just the water streaming down. And that's, that's always a, uh, dare I say, G <laughs> oh baby, that's the next uh, level right there I've for sure. Caught, I've been caught doing that one a couple times, but I mean, I get away with it more often than the other way around. All right, this will be the last question. Torin says, one piece of advice for us, two five nits to get better. Give it to him, Garrett. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I always, uh, to be honest, I always hate this question because like I, there's just not an easy answer. Like the only answer is like get better at poker. Uh, and to get better at poker is obviously just very hard, takes an endless amount of time. And to even sort of give a guess as to what areas are most important to improve upon or or what I mean, it's just it's just impossible to say. If you're trying to make money, uh, game selection is everything. So I, I would at least say that. I mean, I know like so many players who, uh, you know, if they would just put in the hours to play overnight, to play at different casinos, uh, to really put in the hours with game selecting, to to go play the the two five when the five ten at their casino is like garbage that day, mm -hmm. like. That, I mean, that's going to probably be the biggest one thing one can do that doesn't require hundreds of hours of work, you know? And I think when I think some, sometimes I think about like the guys who, uh, who play like really nosebleed games with me that aren't all that strong at poker. Uh, and of course I'm happy to play with them, but I also learn a lot from them and all of the things that they do really well outside of playing poker well on a technical level. And I think if you can find guys like that and you can learn things from them, um, 
that you know that's uh, I, I think that's an important skill as well. So assuming they're not doing anything shady, because some of hmm. some of the guys who do that are are just kind of slimy, shady, etc. But some are not. So Phil Locke's a great example. I've played in some big fucking games with Phil Locke, uh, and and you're like, how how does he get into this game? How does he stay afloat? Like what you know? Uh, he's yeah, he's very good at. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've, like I said, he's got, he's figured out a way to play in big games and like whatever, and uh, he's you know he's not the world's strongest no limit hold'em player, obviously, especially in in modern times where the internet kids would fuck me and fill up just the same. All right, guys, we got to wrap it up because um, I go to the bathroom pretty badly here, and, and first time for the first time I've ever had to do it on first time I've ever actually had to had to go to the bathroom on stream. So this is the first time I've ever ever felt this way on stream right now and it's not a good feeling guys my friends but if you watch the video right now and you enjoy it hit the like button if you want garrett to win 35 million dollars the next time he plays on poker after dark hit the like button right now my coach says i have to ask this about my coach says this otherwise i wouldn't care if my coach yells at me and says i'm being a fucking idiot and if i want to be gto i have to say things like this so that's what i got and uh, if you want to follow garrett he does not update his twitter ever but it's at garrett edelstein uh, there's no N. Adol yeah. Stee. Yeah, it's uh, there's no N in my Twitter. I uh, I will very infrequently like respond to tweets or whatever, but again, I really try to avoid. Uh, I don't know. I just don't want to be an attention whore. You know, sometimes I think about posting things and then I'm like, eh. You know, and I will say, uh, as we've talked about, like, I mean, for your business, like, part of part of your work is marketing via social media, and so. True. For, for many, many people, I, I totally get it. Um, for me, I'm just, like I said, I'm, I don't really have anything to, to monetize. Uh, so, eh, you know, but every while. Fo follow Garrett's journey at Coachella this weekend. Nowhere, as he will not be putting it anywhere. And um, and I will find out about it after the weekend's over, though, because I'm going to find out. I want to see how it went. But, yeah. All the people that I'm going with, I'm sure they, just like every other attendee at Coachella will be making it. I was going to say, Garrett, I think, I think it's actually, you have to, I, I believe I, I read the ticket on back of the tickets. It says that if you go to Coachella, you have to post about it a minimum of three to seven times on Twitter or Instagram. So yeah, I actually don't know if they're going to let you in, but I, I hope they let you in, but I don't think you posted about it obsessively yet. And like made like a cella joke, like, Oh, another cella. Here we go. Like you haven't made a joke like that. So I, I don't know if they're going to let you in, but I, I hope, I hope you're allowed to get in. That's funny that you mentioned that. Yeah, it's like everyone's obsessed with like a new IG post every seven minutes, right? But so one of the Reddit uh, things I've been going through recently is like Coachella Reddit. And every single fucking thing is Cella. Like Cella. Oh, couch yeah. Cella. Like, you know, like every every single word they add Cella to it. And it's just like, uh, <laughs> it's the lamest thing ever, but I also still kind of think it's funny, you know? I know, I find it funny too, for sure, so. But all right, guys, I got to wrap it up. Much love, everybody. Garrett, thanks for coming on the podcast. My friend, was always a good, fun time. Everybody in the chat, Jack Fleming, Nick Nick, Nick Palmer, Alex Fabrics, Chris Alexander, Digital Fox, Josh Sador, Dog Wallace. We love you guys. Much love. Peace out. Adios. Yeah.